Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio, sometimes known as Randy Newberg Unfiltered, but today I've got a cool guest who has returned. This this time he's on my my home ground. Uh, last time I was on his home ground and we just didn't get to talk enough last time. So he's here in Bozeman. He's helping put on a very important wildlife conference. And he called me and said, hey, I'm going to be there. And even though I'm only in town for two days and my wife was kind of looking at me like, what, what, what do you, why aren't we going to dinner tonight? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I said, well, I'll risk marriage and, and I'll get uh, Jim Heffelfinger on, on the podcast with me. So quick as I get through these uh, sponsor plugs, uh, Jim and I are going to talk about why he's here in Bozeman, what this conference is all about. And he was showing me some really cool data on his laptop here about, well, migrations. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, it's so obvious when you see some of this information. It's really compelling about some of the challenges we face and what it's going to take to uh, make sure there's lots of mule deer and antelope and elk and everything else out on the the landscape but we want to thank leupold there's a reason we call it leupold's hunt talk radio is they sponsor everything we do they're making some amazing optics uh i don't know if i'm allowed to say this but i am gonna say it as i'm picking up my prototype spotting scope on friday rifles yesterday and spotting <laughs> scope tomorrow yeah <laughs> you, well, you, i i am so spoiled I, I posted that you saw that on my instagram yeah. page i had yeah. a whole shopping cart full of <laughs> rifles. rifles and i myself and marcus my camera guy we spent the afternoon mounting new vx5 leupold scopes on these new Howard rifles tough day at work i know and i i feel bad to, to i don't want to make it sound like i'm rubbing it in and i'm not But the idea is to tell people, look, they send us this stuff and say, go use it, tell us what works and doesn't work. And when we get back to them, a lot of times they listen and and they want to know, well, why would you use this different combination or this different setup? And so sometimes the answer is because I'm stupid. So (laughs) keep doing what you guys are doing and disregard me. But anyhow... uh, I'm excited to go pick up some more of my prototype stuff from Leupold. That's that. That's probably the funnest part of what I do. Is you feel like the mad scientist a little bit, <laughs> you know, uh, on the ground floor. Yeah, and then we've got Orion Coolers. Uh, next week I'm going to Wyoming for four days of antelope hunting, which puts a smile on my face like a ripple on a slop pail. And that's what my grandpa used to say. He had a smile like a ripple on a slop pail. I, I don't know what it really means, but... Uh, I can wh- see that. Uh, when I, I get excited, I, I say that one. <clears throat> but uh, me and my camera guy, Michael, we're just going to go throw our, our sleeping bags on the ground wherever we end up that day, and we're going to be living out of our Orion coolers. And then hopefully I'll shoot a nice buck and we'll stuff them in those coolers, get them home, get them processed. And man, I love. I could have used one of those on my first pronghorn. I was pretty naive a couple of years into Arizona and it was warm and I shot it and I thought, I'll just run home with it real quick. Uh-huh. Got it and run home with it real quick. And I didn't think pronghorn was good meat for a while until I actually treated the meat correctly yeah. and then found out it really was. Yeah. Well, it's, it's definitely a challenge with pronghorn because you're usually hunting them in hot weather mm-hmm. and they can go bad if you don't do it. So with us, OrionCoolers.com, if you go out to that website and you use promo code Randy, we make it, then we make this so simple for everybody. Promo code Randy. For everything. Yeah. Uh, they're going to give you this really cool tumbler. Plus, you're going to buy the best cooler I've ever been able to find. OrionCoolers.com. Uh, the other one is GoHunt.com. Uh, you've heard us. We've been talking about their uh, 30-day free trial for this insider service that we use. And if you want to do that, uh, it's close to expiring. By the time this podcast uh, rolls out, there's a chance that the the 30-day free trial might have ended. But I'm going to give you the link just in case it's still there. It's uh, gohunt.com forward slash Randy. And you get everything, the draw odds, the research, the strategy articles, not just strategy in general, but by state, by species, you name it. Public land, private land of each unit, uh, harvest stats for each unit. It's all there 
at your fingertips in one place, gohunt.com. Uh, it's called the insider. So if you go to gohunt.com forward slash Randy, do the 30 day free trial. If you're listening to this and you go there and it says, oh, 30 day free trial is over. Well, sign up at gohunt.com for the insider and use promo code Randy and you'll get $50 of credit in their gear shop. And they got nothing but the best gear in that gear shop. That, that isn't like the dollar store type gear shop there. It's serious stuff. So either way, you're going to get something for going there and signing up. I, I think I could hear your Minnesota heritage when you say turdy day. Turdy? The turdy yeah, day. Yeah, the turdy, turdy day, day there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you betcha there. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I better not do that. You, <laughs> yeah, Jim, I was just there a month ago. That's where it, it surfaces. Well, I grew up in Wisconsin, so it was so the... You can pick it up yeah. right oh, away, yeah. huh? So uh, then the the one that we, those of you who followed it, we did a whole series of uh, uh, e-scouting videos with Onyx Maps. Uh, they're, they're just a big supporter of what we do because their product is the absolute perfect fit for the public land Western hunter who, especially if you're hunting states where you've got public private issues you're trying to navigate um you want to have aerial view you want all this stuff and now they've made it so it's an app on a smartphone which is so much more powerful than when i was just using their chip on in my old gps and uh one other this this is a plug jim uh you you can apply you might win (laughs) on x and the rocky mountain elk foundation called me and said randy will you do a promo hunt for 2019? I said, guys, I told you I'm not doing any more promo hunts. They said, ah, oh, come on, you'll do one. I'm like, yeah, I will. They're a lot of fun. So if someone wants to go elk hunting in 2019, all expenses paid, travel, everything, free set of Sitka gear, Onyx Maps and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation are host. There, how do I say this? You go to their websites uh, and they get, have the big link, sign up here. And what it is, is I'm taking someone elk hunting for five days. I saw that. I didn't know if I was eligible. I was tempted. You're, you're eligible. <laughs> it, no, no family. That would be fun. And no employees. My employees, mm-hmm. they've said, well, if we draw, do we get to go? I said, uh, you aren't getting paid if you go. But no, the fine print says no employees or family members. But anyhow, if you want to go uh, elk hunting with us, uh, that's your chance. Uh, go there, read the rules. Um on X and Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation are making that possible. And it'll be a five-day rifle hunt in the fall of 2019. You know, I kept, I hear you talk about Onyx all the time, and you don't know I'm going to say this, but okay, I don't like people trying to sell me things and go buy yeah. this, go buy this. And I keep hearing you talk about Onyx and use a promo code Randy. And so it just went in one ear and out the other. And, and preparing for my son's turkey hunt this year, I've always been frustrated with my Garmin GPS. It just, it takes a long time to refresh. They have the toggle so that when you reach for it, you cover the screen. I just, I I don't like it. And I'm always frustrated with it. And I heard that and I thought, well, you know what? I'll try that, that seven day free trial. And I did that back in April, right before his turkey hunt and thought, well, I have nothing to lose. I've got my GPS too. And and I've got my cell phone and there's some areas there that don't have very good cell coverage. So it'd be a really good test. And so I took it along. And the first morning we got out and I saved a waypoint where we were. And I was playing around with it. And I thought, this is pretty cool. And I never took my GPS out of my pack. Really? At all. <laughs> and, I, and I recorded a track of everywhere that we walked. I saved waypoints. Um, and, and I could zoom in. There was one spot. And I beforehand, I saved, I downloaded. You could do that once, <laughs> right. I think, with the promo. Yeah. And I saved um, a map of that in one, one part of that area because we were hunting this one particular mountain. And there was only one time where we dropped down into a canyon where we heard a gobbler that I lost coverage and I could pull up that background. I don't even know what it's called. Right. I pull up that background image and and see everywhere that we needed to go. I could see the inside of the canyon, even though I didn't have coverage. I was floored. I yeah. was floored. And I, and I initially said, I'm not paying that much every year. I want to go buy a GPS unit and then I have it forever. Well, this, I gladly pay that every <laughs> year because because this is awesome. I mean, it's really, it, it was, and, and, you know, this isn't set up. You didn't know I was going to say that. I but did not. I, I was... I was just amazed at how cool that was. Yeah. And like I said, before that, it was like, don't try to sell me stuff. I don't want to hear about <laughs> all, your, you know, all your sponsors, but I, right. I'll pay that every year. It, it's really great, well, and, I, and I won't be using my GPS. That's a good testimonial, Jim. That, yeah, that's I love really it. good. And if you go out to onxmaps.com, 
and you buy the app product, and again, if you use promo code Randy, you're going to save 20%. Did you use promo did. code? Oh, yep. did you? Yep. And you saved 20%? Mm-hmm. I did. Oh, yep. And then I got, it on my, um, I got it on my computer at home. Yeah. And I just go to the computer, pop yeah. it up, and zoom Isn't in on stuff. Slick? The stuff you can do on your, yeah. on your desktop now nope. or your laptop. And yep. there it is. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, you know what? I, I think someday when I'm done with this gig, I'm going to sell my OnX account. <laughs> I'm going to sell my login <laughs> yeah, you credentials. Could. You could. I'm going to uh-huh. auction it off. Mm-hmm. And we'll put the I, money in an account and Jim and a few other science people can decide where it gets spent. Yeah. Yep. How's that? Yeah, that sounds good. I've okay. I've gotten GPS units as a as a regional biologist in, in Arizona and from some of the some of our biologists in remote areas and, and I'll download their GPS with that has that particular survey, pronghorn survey or whatever that I need. And then I notice that what downloads with it is their elk salt salt <laughs> licks and all of their all of their secret <laughs> spots. And I'll usually I'll go and I'll zoom in on those and I'll clip out a JPEG and I'll email it to them and say, Well, how much would you pay if I just delete this and don't sell it to somebody? <laughs> and they're shocked that I have all their secret <laughs> spots oh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. well i'm gonna have to uh my staff has the login credentials i might have to change my, no. my, my crew <laughs> that they, they could probably get paid more than i pay them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it could. Oh, but anyhow folks uh jim heffelfinger is here with us and if you listen to our podcast when we were down in southern arizona last year on our what i call sonoran safari uh, Jim joined us there for an evening and we were having so much fun. Uh, it's unbelievable what a fun trip that was. And we're doing it again this year. This will be our yeah. third year in a row. Until yeah. the day they plant me in the ground, every January I'm going to Southern Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it, it is that great. But Jim is the wildlife science coordinator for Arizona Game and Fish. Um, he's a... Uh, Oh, a pro- prolific writer, uh, researcher. Uh, what, what What's your true educational background, Jim? I, I mean, you're like Mr. Google. Like, yeah. <laughs> if, if it comes to deer, I'm not going to Google. I'm calling you. People have told me when you're the only one I know that when I actually when I Google your name, you're, you're actually the one that comes up. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, I, I like to write, so I've got a. I've got a footprint out there, I guess. Uh-huh. I, I got a bachelor's degree in wildlife management at um, UW Stevens Point, Central Wisconsin, and then got sick of shoveling snow, so I was looking for graduate projects elsewhere and did a master's degree in South Texas at Texas A&M Kingsville. Okay. And you've been at Arizona Game and Fish for... 26 years. 26? Yeah, I had a short couple month gig with the BLM in Carlsbad. <laughs> um, before that, I worked as a wildlife, uh, as a manager of wildlife operations for a trophy whitetail ranch in South Texas. Deer have always really been my specialty and my interest, but big game in general are, uh, are things I like to play around with. And so... I was with the BLM for a couple months and really the federal biologist was not what I was thinking. I like to deal with hunting and hunt structures and game animals and yeah. found myself dealing with, with backcountry byways and, and mineral extractions and EAs and reviewing documents. And no. that wasn't all what I was really thinking. And so Arizona Game Fish called me up and said, we've got a job where you can hang out of a helicopter and count bighorn sheep and do telemetry and turkeys and do pronghorn surveys from the plane and do hunt recommendations and... Um, I was there in a month. Yeah. How did I sign up for that one? (laughs) Yep. So 26 years, Arizona didn't become a state until what, 1911? (laughs) 1912. Okay. They were what, the 48th state? Um, I don't know. You shouldn't test me like that. Or is New Mexico the 48th? Anyhow, I remember which was the 48th. You you were, you started working under like the second governor of Arizona or something, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, Well... Uh, I got to ask you what uh, I, you've told me, but let's tell the audience this very important topic that brings you to Bozeman, Montana. And yeah. In the middle of elk season, what are you guys doing? I know, you would think we were a bunch of non-hunters or anti-hunters to try yeah. to schedule everybody together. Yeah, we heard about that, but with the, the high power people that we've got coming together for this, uh, everybody's schedules, you just got to work everybody's schedules out. And yeah. so sometimes elk season isn't like the number one priority. Um, but we're together in Bozeman. This is the fourth of what will be, this will be the last one, four workshops to get biologists from, in this case, it's, it's Idaho and Montana together 
to, to kind of talk with them and show them some successful methods that have been used in Wyoming on how to, uh, how to identify migration corridors, movement corridors, and winter range, how to collect that kind of information, what kind of GPS collars, how often they need to get fixes and that sort of thing. So, so how to collect the information, how to analyze the infinite information with uh, a method that's called Brownian Bridge uh, Movement Model, which is a, a really neat way to produce this like heat map of where the migration corridor is. And so when you analyze it that way, you've got a really neat visual aid that you can then map. And it's really powerful when you take to a meeting or you use in a publication to show where these migration corridors are. And, and people can see that visually. You can give them all kinds of data and it just doesn't have the impact. But when you show them a map of the migration corridors where they're squeezing through these little bottleneck areas on the edge of town and that sort of thing, it's really powerful and it gets people activated and gets people engaged and gets people worried about preserving those corridors. And it's really important that we preserve these this habitat connectivity, um, not only between winter and summer ranges, but between other areas that, that big game need. Yeah, well, <clears throat> the Wyoming Migration Initiative, I follow that on, they have their... Facebook, they they, mm -hmm. they have done a great job. The best um, of, of any other like wildlife or science uh, or university entity I've seen. They're pounding all the social media platforms and doing yeah. just a fantastic job. Are, are they kind of the the model that others are trying to catch up? Very much. I've of, used them as an yeah. example. And, and there are more and more in, in academia, you see researchers talking about how they really need to get more engaged with social media and, and Twitter and get their information out there and, and spread the word and also get some engagement from people. And so there's a push to do more and more of that. But, but my uh, Wyoming Migration Initiative and led by Matt Kaufman, who's the leader of the Wyoming uh, co-op at the University of Wyoming, and, and they're really they're really way out ahead of everybody doing that sort of thing. So that's at Wyoming, University of Wyoming in it's Laramie? University it's Wyoming. Not... Yep. Yeah, so um, so Matt Kaufman and the people that work with him in the co-op unit, they're actually government uh, scientists, USGS. And um, so the, the the cooperative is is really a unique thing. There's 40 or 44 wildlife co-ops, wildlife and fisheries co-ops throughout the country. And they're federal USGS scientists that are embedded in a university. And there's, there's um, normally only one per state. And, and not every state, there's only 40 or so. And they're, they're embedded in the university, so they're federal scientists, but they're treated as faculty at the university. And wow. so, and so, um, so Matt Kaufman and his crew are USGS biologists and, and scientists and, and just embedded at the university. Now, the Wyoming Migration Initiative is, is just kind of a, a composite consortium of a lot of collaborators, not just at Wy University of Wyoming, but other universities and, and other um, NGOs, too, that are working together on this common thing of migration initiative. Well, I, I, I go out here all the time, and I just pulled it up on my phone because I wanted to make sure I gave the right URL. Mm -hmm. But it's migrationinitiative.org. Yep. And me, actually my crew, we're out there all the time. We're on their, all their social media stuff because they come up with, like you said, visuals that take stuff mm -hmm. that's really science heavy and almost hard to believe if someone mm -hmm. told it to you or you read it. And then you see it on a map and sure. this visual, easy to understand. And it's like, whoa. Mm -hmm. We yeah. got to do something about that. Yeah, here's deer 255, and here's where we collared it, and here's where she ended up, and that sort of thing. And um, it's it's remarkable. It's, it's a deer actually did that, and there's a line on the map that shows what it did. And um, so it, it that that Wyoming migration initiative came out of some of the early information coming out of Wyoming, where uh, Hall Sawyer, who's actually here in town, he'll be with us the next uh, day and a half, uh, put some radio collars uh, around in the Red Desert. And, and thought they were resident animals, mule deer, yeah. thought they were resident animals, and they put the GPS collars that would, would record a GPS location every, every two hours throughout the 24-hour cycle. And they just thought they'd figure out where they were in the Red Desert and were shocked to see that that, that population migrated 150 miles uh, up, to, um, from, up to Hoback, up yeah. to, right towards Jackson up in the northwest, and, and then came back down in, uh, the next year. And they would do that every year. So 150-mile migration, which is the longest, um, the longest migration in the lower 48s that, for, for a big game animal. Yeah, Sorry, I got a, I crossed my wires there. Yeah. But uh, that, I drive that a lot. Mm -hmm. In fact, one day I'm going to be driving that again right. on my way down to the Red Desert mm -hmm. right, where I have mm -hmm. a, a pronghorn tag. And when you see what those deer must go through 
We yeah. need to see you get north of Daniel's Junction up in the Hoback. It's a Hoback Junction. And you think if you were a human, even if you were fully geared and supplied and had the finest clothing and all the needs of comfort, could you make it all the way down to Bags, Wyoming? Right. And, and that Red there. Desert to Hoback, 150 miles, there's something like 111 fence crossings, just uncountable number of jurisdiction or land ownership changes from private to BLM to Forest Service to state land, yeah. um, back and forth with, with all kinds of different management. I don't know how many different road crossings, but an unbelievable number of potential obstacles to slow those animals down and still they make that. But but identifying that corridor then allowed them to take that corridor and look really specifically at, at in like five different parts of that corridor. In each one of those segments, what's the, the most constrictive thing? What's the biggest problem we need to focus on? And so they could prioritize, here's the biggest problems along that priority route, and then start working on the highest priorities along there and try to resolve those problems to make sure that corridor stays free. Yeah, well, the this whole migration part of, of what they did I'm, I'm now seeing it pop up in other places the, mm-hmm. the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation is working with Arthur Middleton who is doing it on elk of mm-hmm. the elk that go east out of Yellowstone Park towards Cody and the information he is finding is there are serious pinch points that are mm-hmm. so critical of if these were to somehow be developed, disappear, or make it impossible for these elk, what then happens to yeah. that whole eastern herd that is so important mm-hmm. to oh, yellow eastern side of Yellowstone, plus all the hunting that happens yep. out on that face between Cody and, and south of there, all sure. the way almost, I guess, almost down to Dubois. Yeah, could, could have serious implications for huge herds of some of these big game animals that, that we all enjoy. So all of you are here. Yeah, so studying. what we're doing here is, is that. You said you're seeing more and more of that. And so this is um, part of a push that the Mule Deer Working Group through the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies that we call WAFWA, working with the folks at, at Wyoming have been doing this for, for a while, and Pew Charitable Trust, um, Mule, Deer, uh, Mule Deer Foundation, and Fish and Wildlife Services contributing money too as part of their Sagebrush Science Initiative. So we've all come together with some money and organization with the Mule Deer Working Group um, kind of taking the lead to start to organize these these workshops and is to pull biologists from a couple neighboring states together, teach them how to do that Browning Bridge migration um, uh, or movement uh, model and then visualize and save that information. And then that's, that's half of these workshops. The other half of it we devote to discussing how that information can actually be translated into policy to actually do some good on the ground to, to codify how important these migration corridors and winter ranges are and, and so that they can be preserved administratively not just so we can visualize them and think they look really cool on instagram so that's where that's a little bit different in that a lot of times we we as hunters think that biologists are out there gathering data for season setting or Uh for whatever Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this kind of information is allowing biologists to I'll, i'll kind of hijack what roosevelt used to say speaking on the half, On behalf, right? Yeah, um, mm-hmm. you right. Know, the the wildlife and the habitat cannot speak for itself. Therefore, we must and we will. Is his mm-hmm. famous quote. Well, it's giving you and others the the voice to right? stand up yeah. and say, "Oh, if you're going to build this, whatever it might be uh, that we call human progress, here's places where the accommodation for wildlife is important." Mm-hmm. And Mm-hmm. Very yeah. obvious example of, of collecting data uh, and collecting data that actually can be used to do good things at a whole conservation of a whole population level rather than just uh, how many permits we're going to have next year in that unit. Yeah. Well, this is powerful stuff. Yeah. Do, is, it, is it easy to get this kind of stuff funded or is it... It, it has been recently because of the excitement and the momentum. All of the Western state directors are, I've been briefing them the last two meetings of the Western Association, and they're really excited about this kind of coordinated effort among all the other states. This is what the Western Association Fish and Wildlife Agencies is supposed to be doing, is coordinating this kind of West-wide stuff where we have similar needs and, and similar tools. And so what's neat about this is not only that we take these workshops, and we started out with a workshop in, in um in Salem, Oregon, where we brought together California, Oregon, and Washington, and we did that Pacific Northwest, and and that was last October. And so then after that workshop, we thought this is a really good thing, and we knew we wanted to do this. And after that workshop, 
Secretary Zinke signed in February at the Western Hunting and Conservation Expo, he signed the Secretarial Order 3362, which told all, all agencies in the Department of the Interior that, that the Secretary wanted them to identify winter ranges and corridors and take steps to protect these. And, and he moved funding to make that happen, to, to actually do the research to identify the corridors and then some of the places where we had corridors identified using funds to actually do something to fix some of the problems that we had in there. That came about in February. That was right after our first workshop and we were planning on having a series of these workshops throughout the West. So the next one was in um, Mesquite, Nevada in the spring. And so uh, the Casey Stemmler, who was a person from the Fish and Wildlife Service who Secretary Zinke appointed to implement this secretarial order on migration corridors, he attended that one and he attended the last one and he'll be here in town this weekend uh, to kind of set the stage and, and, and help us. But it's really, it's a state-led uh, effort. And so we started in Salem, Oregon. We had another one in Mesquite, Nevada. We had one last month in Laramie. And then this is the last one in Bozeman. And with those four workshops, we've gathered all of the Western states uh, that are involved in, in, in this sort of thing. And so all of those biologists learning how to analyze data the same way is incredibly powerful because not only do they have a really cool, easy way to do it using uh, an app and some software that they developed in Wyoming, but if everybody's analyzing these corridors the same way, they can be knitted together for a big west-wide look of, of habitat connectivity and corridors in winter range throughout the west, which is really powerful to have wow. agencies working together and not just working in their little silos by themselves. Yeah, so uh, when you talk about U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and Casey? That's Casey Stemmler. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Is he? Does, are they comfortable letting the states drive the bus? Yes, very much so. They're, um, the, cool. This push with the migration corridors, the, the federal agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, Secretary of the Interior, recognizes that the state wildlife agencies are the ones with all of these data to, uh, to, to look at these corridors, to identify the corridors. And so it's, it's, they've, they've put the state agencies in the driver's seat to lead this effort to take their data, use their biologists to put it together. You know, another model that could have been done a decade ago under a different administration is to say, we're, we're the federal government, we're here to help, and we're going to have our federal scientists, and they're going to come in and analyze. Send us all your data, state agencies, and we're going to analyze it because we want to implement the secretarial order. It's being very done very differently. The whole push is it's state agency data. You guys are, are the ones that have the information. We want your biologists to analyze your own data and in a way that we can put all this together and inform federal policy and hopefully state policy. And so it's been awesome to have that kind of recognition and respect of the state wildlife agencies from the federal agencies. Wow. That's that. That's not the norm we hear about. It is not. Yeah, it's not <laughs> been the model for sure. <laughs> uh, so when you do this data of these deer that migrate from southern Utah to northern Arizona, are you going to share that with me? I can. I, I, I glossed by it on, on that same document that we were looking at. Oh, really? Yeah, I can show you those those dots because the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources put some new GPS collars, and they've they've got tons of GPS collars. I think they have. Um, more than a thousand deer GPS collars out right now on deer and about 500 on elk. So Utah is going like gangbusters and they've hired a coordinator that does only that, Daniel Olson in Utah. And so they radio collared a whole bunch of deer, not only in Southern Utah by the Arizona border, but in collaboration with us, they paid for the collars and actually collared some deer in Arizona right on this side of the border. Okay. And so we can, we can together look at those interstate movements of, of deer between the Kaibab and the Ponce Gun. Okay. And we know they move in between there. Yeah. So last winter, I was uh, I got a phone call from the Wild Sheep Foundation and said, Randy, we're going to go collar some sheep. You and your crew want to come and film it. And a thought that went through my mind, I never asked anybody, but when you brought it up here in my mind again, what does one of those collars cost? They're, the prices are going way down. They were in the they were five thousand uh, dollars several years ago for GPS collars, but some of the bare bones ones they're getting for like eight hundred dollars now. Okay. And so it's with that reduction. Not everybody's using the eight hundred dollar collars, but with that reduction in cost just translates into us using the same amount of conservation dollars to radio collar a whole bunch more animals and technology is increasing. So each collar lasts longer. Battery life is better so you can get more locations um, in a 24 hour period. So 
things are all, the stars are all kind of aligning for the technology coming together and having this momentum from the federal level and the state agencies working on this stuff. So you're going to see some really neat stuff coming down the road in the, in the next couple of years as we start gathering and putting together this migration information. So you've been in this 26 years. GPS callers, some of the younger people listening probably think they've always been around. Right. Some it, of the younger people probably think GPS has always been around. <laughs> but my first GPS, you had to pull the antenna up. Yeah. Straight up. Yeah. <laughs> so the ability to get this kind of information is it's is crazy yeah and it's, we used to have to just triangulate you'd, you'd follow yeah. the beep or you'd point the antenna where the beep was and then you'd drive over and then you get another fix on it from an angle and from those two angles where they converge that's where the animal was well you, you can imagine trying to identify a migration corridor of even 20 radio collar deer trying to do it that way you, you just can't you there's no way you would define exactly where they're going yeah well, that's uh, it's exciting to see this kind of stuff because it's very proactive. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. in the hunting world, we always feel like, oh, we're just always being reactive. Yeah, or and, trying to make sure that the bottom doesn't drop out of something or trying to recover something. So, yeah, it's really neat to be out there kind of on offense and gathering really good information. Then we're looking down the road at the future and trying to prepare for the future and, and keeping habitat connected. And, and not severing some of the long migration corridors. Yeah, a lot of times I'm driving from Twin Falls, Idaho to Wells, Nevada. And when I drive that stretch, when I get into Nevada, there's a lot of fences with overpasses. Mm-hmm. Is, is those are, I, I'm assuming those are designed for That's the, the end game, yeah. That's what all this or, or information... Or the deer, I mean. Yeah, everything. And, and it depends on the area and, and what it's designed for. But usually elk and deer are kind of the, in the same areas, whereas pronghorn, more open areas. But all of this information showing a really concentrated crossing on an interstate where they really need help getting across or a really busy highway, that that transitions into these overpasses. Usually overpasses, sometimes underpasses, sometimes mm-hmm. a combination of both on a stretch. But... That's what we're getting to is to get information to inform where to put those. And we've got some pretty good information about how they should be designed now to be most effective because Mm -hmm. we're building these around the country and we kind of know what has to be done. Really the problem with those is those overpasses are a couple million dollars. I think they're talking about some wildlife overpasses now you can get away with building one for only $2 million, that sort of thing. Ooh. So when you go to your Department of Transportation and say, <laughs> hey, we've got elk getting killed on the highway here and we've got GPS collars that show they cross, we need a crossing right here. They just look at you cross-eyed. Like they're not going to spend $3 million to let some, some elk cross the road. That was years ago. Now they're seeing the value in this and state agencies are doing a much better job of working with their Department of Transportation years ahead of when they – they make a highway, they improve a highway, so they're going to expand it, they're going to increase traffic flow, or they're going to build a new highway. And state agencies are, are now having having workshops and symposia with their their DOTs, Department of Transportation, years ahead of time and working these things out. And Department of Transportation, they've got some money to bring into it. They're just not going to pay for the entire overpass. So it was a state wildlife agency and an NGO a couple NGOs can get together and all pool together a bunch of money. We can get some of these things done. And so the fences that you talk about, if you just put an overpass where the the elk cross, they may not take to that bridge over the highway very quickly. And so it has to be accompanied with some deer proof fencing along the highway. So when they come to the highway, it, it, they have to follow that fence and it funnels them across. Yeah. And it's been super effective. We've done a lot of work. Arizona Game and Fish with Jeff Gagnon and Scott Sprague are two of our researchers that have done a lot of this work for the last decade or two. And we've got really good data showing all of these big game animals getting killed on the road. We put in a couple of crossings, put in this fencing, and it, and it drops like 99%. Really dramatic. Really, really dramatic. that big of a difference. Yeah, because they can't really get across. They're, they're fenced and funneled into these crossings. And so during those migration times, they're all getting across. You know, it's, it's very hard for one to defeat that fencing system and somehow get whacked on their own. So, yeah. so they're really effective. So uh, I drive across places of Wyoming and uh, I, as it comes to mind, I think about some places in Utah where it looks like there's deer proof fencing and then there's just some dirt berms. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Those are it, jump outs. What, they well, tell make, me what they, that is. Yeah, they call them jump outs. So the same scenario I just described, you've got some overpasses, underpasses, and then you have deer-proof fencing along the highway. Well, in there, if, if a deer does get through a hole in the fence, because everybody knows how hard it is to keep up fences, mm-hmm. so a deer could squeak through a hole in the fence. Now you've got both sides of the highway fence, and now they're trapped on the highway. And now they're guaranteed to get whacked at some point or another. And so periodically, they put these dirt berms that start on the inside by the highway, and the dirt berm slopes up to yep. to the fence and there's the fence is usually lower there there's a little gap so if a deer is in there he can find one of those ramps run up the ramp and then jump out of the fence basically without having to jump over a seven proof a seven foot deer proof fence they can just run up this ramp and jump down about six feet and they're out huh. so it's an escape ramp is what it is so how different is it for antelope which really have an aversion to jumping fences versus elk and deer that seem to handle jumping a fence a little bit better is it pretty much the same principle? yeah prong pronghorn so much the jump outs mostly you see in elk and deer habitat with the crossings with pronghorn it has to be an overpass because they're not going to go through a tunnel they're not going to go through an underpass so pronghorn they've got to have that wide open visibility but overpasses wide overpasses have been effective for allowing pronghorn to cross back and forth <laughs> and they've got to be wide enough. You can't do a little 10-foot wide bridge and think they're going to tiptoe their way across. So it's got to be wide enough. So and it's got some native vegetation so that they feel comfortable in going across. So you were showing me on the laptop there some pronghorn that Arizona Game and Fish had collared. And yeah. you tracked them through GPSs. Mm-hmm. Put yeah. GPS collars on them. And, and it was around Flagstaff with I-40 running east and west. So it's just major freeway. And we put some radio collars on pronghorn. It's interesting because you see these seasonal movements in relation to snow depth where the pronghorn will move and then they get to the freeway and they just stop and they ball up by the freeway. And some of the pronghorn on the north side of the freeway, you see them come down and hit the freeway and ball up. And so you radio collar a number of animals near the freeway and you see the same pattern. Wyoming is, is illustrated and other, other states have illustrated it too, where it's really obvious that those animals historically went through that area where the, where the interstate is and now they're stopping at the interstate and not getting across. And so it illustrates that there's, there's a, a, a ghost of an old uh, migration corridor there that we've now disrupted with the freeway. And that's the kind of information we can use to decide where maybe we need some crossings to reinstate that movement pattern, the historical movement pattern. From a, a financial and political cost, is it likely that, to use an example over by Ash Fork or Seligman mm-hmm. or I-40. It's an area we're looking at too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it practical in a... I'm using Arizona, but it could be any state. Do you think that the money and political will would be there to build an overpass? I think so. The momentum is really gaining where Department of Transportation are now really interested in listening to state wildlife agencies, contributing some of the money. And with a lot of this outreach that we do, like, like what they've been doing in Wyoming, the general public is loving this stuff. They think this is so fascinating and, and it illustrates how important it is. And when we start showing pictures of these, uh, these pronghorn that get to the freeway and stop, the general public gets interested. And whenever you get the general public that says, what are we going to do about that? We, we need those animals to cross. <laughs> now you've got a general grassroots public support and you've got some of these bigger agencies that are already moving in the direction of putting some money into that. And so you're going to see a lot more talk about uh, highway connectivity and, and even the, the national um, transportation funding is being used to do a lot of this stuff. So a lot of really exciting momentum all moving in the same direction. And these workshops are kind of the incubation period for for getting that those methods and those ideas yep. to the state biologists yep. who are being relied upon. Right. It's it's information that we saw Wyoming was was doing a good job at, and and originally uh, Pew Charitable Trust, which are, they're open, they're they're interested in, in wide open spaces in the West, and they came and said. Wouldn't it be great if, if the mule deer working group and all of your infrastructure, all your mule deer biologists that you're in touch with and, and, and working with would collaborate with some of those folks in Wyoming and see if we can outsource that knowledge of what they're doing in Wyoming and do that on a broader landscape in the West. And through that collaboration, we started thinking about putting on some workshops. And, and like I mentioned before, we put on one, and then we had the secretarial order be signed right after our first one. And, and so as soon as Casey Stemmler was appointed to implement that, 
that order, we were in touch with him and he plugged right into our workshops and, and, and we just off we went. It, it was just, it was kind of a, a perfect storm where we thought it was a good idea, but then all of a sudden everybody else thought it was a good idea too. And we all started charging in the same direction. Yeah. Well, I've been lucky to sit in on some uh, presentations where the Wyoming group has shown video of how they're capturing these images because mm -hmm. their imagery and yeah, I, and this is amazing. Just, this is just somebody who creates visual media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the imagery they have with cameras and videos is so engaging. I, I don't care where you live or what you do; they have that dialed in. And they do. Joe it, Reese and and Arthur Middleton have worked together too um, in Wyoming, and and I've seen them talk together. In fact, I think they talked to the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies when we were in Cody for a summer meeting. But not only the images that they're collecting, but as I think you were talking about, some of the video of showing them collecting those images <laughs> and sitting by in a blind by a stream side and having these animals floundering, trying to swim across this raging uh, storm as they're as a raging uh, current as they're trying to video them. It's, it's, it's really neat. They've it, done some neat things. It's compelling stuff. And for me, when I was watching that, I saw the same stuff. Arthur mm -hmm, probably. Uh, Middleton gave it to us at the Elk Foundation. And when I watched that, what, what was going through my head is this is the bridge that connects the non-hunting person to a concern for wildlife or an interest in wildlife. And back to your point of, if you get these larger state agencies feeling pressure from the general public that we got, we have to take care of this wildlife. Mm -hmm. we're, we're having an impact on the landscape. That's way better than if just five or 10% of the population. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Right. It, like, like you said, these images are engaging everybody. The, the 90 Five percent of the people, ninety-two percent of the people that don't hunt, all of a sudden are really interested in elk migration corridors and mule deer migration corridors, and they wouldn't be if it wasn't for all these images and, and stuff. So that that's a really neat component too, is that you have all of this non-hunting segment of the population suddenly really interested in, in mule deer and what's going on with mule deer populations. Yeah, well, in Montana, we could use all all that uh, migration. I don't care what information it is because we got these brutal winners we deal with here. Yeah. Do you guys have a lot of winter kill in Arizona? Or we don't know. Do, or do you have more drought kill? Yeah, drought kill, really. We rarely have winter kill. We have, we've had some instances like in, in this, in, I think it was the winter of 67, 68, was a famous pronghorn winter kill where they, they got heavy snows and they moved and they came up against these network fences and just died in the corner of the fences. And that was a real famous incident. But yeah, they're pretty few and far between. But in if we get a, a dry year, especially a couple dry summers, really dry summers in a row, that's our new nutritional choke point is getting animals in, in most of Arizona through the end of May and June and the first week in July before the monsoon rains come or in, in early July. So that June period is really like our February in the Northern Rockies, okay. just trying to get animals through that, that nutritional bottleneck for the year. Well, our mule deer farm is pretty much Eastern Montana, East of Billings. And they had another brutal winter last year. That's their second brutal second winter. In a row. And mm -hmm. it's and, and a lot of the West didn't have a, a, a bad winter last year. They did yeah. the year before. Yeah, the year before, Idaho and some of Wyoming, Idaho just got hammered mm -hmm. the year before. That was bad. Yeah. So how are we going to solve those kind of problems? Yeah, that's a, that's a harder problem to solve for sure. <laughs> I thought that's um, what you were going to tell me, yeah. Jim. <laughs> but really what we're talking about is this habitat connectivity and, and, and allowing, maintaining these passageways so animals can get from winter range to summer range. And in some cases, they, they normally come down in winter in this one area, but if you have deep, deep snows, sometimes they'll go farther down in elevation. And so it, it's landscape connectivity is is really the answer to maintaining the these herds so that they have that flexibility to get where they need to go to just to just survive some of those harsh events yeah well i'm glad that a guy who hunts as much as you do <laughs> and is serious about hunting in addition to being a scientist is excited about this stuff because it, yeah I, I, can, I can see it in your face and the, right. the in your voice this is exciting to you right yeah especially like my four months with the blm when they wanted me to be really interested in, in songbird surveys and <laughs> and things like that. And it was really hard to get interested in that. And then, and then even in the intervening years, federal agencies so often are just, they, they were all focused on endangered species, which they have to be, but right. it was like all endangered species and nobody cared about you talking about,
about this new forest plan not addressing mule deer concerns or Mern's quail concerns or Gould's turkey concerns. They didn't really care about that because they had these other higher priority endangered species. And so now seeing federal agencies and seeing so much buzz about these big game animals is just fantastic. Yeah, I am really yeah. excited about that. That's cool. So what else is uh, is the, well, how should I say this? Are the bubbling issues that our audience needs to know about as it relates to a person like you involved in the Mule Deer Working Group? Yeah, we've, we, um, we've got, actually, I should mention the website, MuleDeerWorkingGroup.com, and that's just a one-stop shopping. It has everything that our Mule Deer Working Group has, has produced, and a lot of it is, is the, some of it's scientific stuff for other biologists, because that's kind of the thing we do, but there's a lot of it that's just um, for, for the general public. We, we're we working on a series of fact sheets, which I think everybody would be interested in, and the fact sheets were, were developed. We have, I think, 25 of, no, we may have 28 of them now, and they're all uh, on that on that website and each fact sheet is just one sheet of paper they're they're available as pdfs on the website front and back with a couple pictures and they address some topic of interest and so there's a fact sheet on predation affecting mule deer populations there's a fact sheet on um, winter feeding and when is that appropriate and when is that appropriate there's another fact sheet on elk and, and mule deer uh, competition or, or increasing elk population is really a problem there's something on uh, pinion juniper encroachment there's something on fire Ooh. there's something on all of these issues that when you come to a public meeting these are the issues that come up normally right. and so we've got these fact sheets and the neat thing about these fact sheets is that they're not 30 pages with a bunch of citations they're no citations it's just front and back of a piece of paper uh, and it's basically the public being able to to ask all of the west leading mule deer people okay what's the deal on winter feeding tell me just tell me the short deal on winter feeding what's the real deal on predation i mean what's the deal on predators so it's a neat way to go and just get a snapshot overview but behind it is all the all the west leading mule deer biologists so that's a that's a cool thing to check out all of those topics and see what the latest science is but in a really easily digestible it's, way to read it what is the url again it's yeah. mule deer working group Dot com. com. So all one word, meal deer working group. Okay. Dot com. Because uh, I thought we should get all of our information from Facebook. Yeah. The interwe- interweb. Yeah. yeah. Or, or down really at the good bar. Stuff, because, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I, I say that somewhat <laughs> tongue in cheek, but, and this is, my, I used to coach my son's Pop Warner football team. Mm-hmm. And he's like, Dad, you're harder on me than anyone else. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah. And I don't I, care how the other kids grow up. <laughs> right. But but part of that is I've always been harder on myself and the community I belong to than I am others. So, and the reason I, I say that is I have a higher expectation of hunters having their poop in a group mm-hmm, than I right. do of general public. Yep. So yep. when I see or hear hunters blowing and carrying on about stuff that, you know they're either making it up or they did hear it down at the bar Mm -hmm. or they read it on a Mm -hmm. bathroom wall or something. It frustrates me. Right. That's why anytime there's a website like you just mentioned or a group like the Mule Deer Working Group that's putting information out, Mm -hmm. I want the world to know about that, at least the hunting world. So we don't, lose our credibility and look like a bunch yeah, of... Yeah, sometimes we're criticized for preaching to the choir, but I think it's really important to preach to the choir. I mean, we all need to be on the same page and we all need to be informed. And I, yeah, I don't like, and you don't want to spend a lot of time on, on forums, but I don't like to get on forums and see hunters just saying really dumb things. And, you know, it just disappoints me. Yeah, I own a forum called yeah, HuntTalk.com. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but the, the good part there is... You don't we, moderate it and correct everybody, though. I, I don't, but we have a a lot of biologists that hang mm-hmm. out there, a lot of scientists who hang out there. It's great when you've and, got that engagement. And so you better have your stuff dialed in on Hunt Talk. If you're going to pipe mm-hmm. up, expect that if you made that up in the last 20 minutes that someone's going to call you on it. Yeah, I've or, done that and that's really effective where someone, uh, one thread just starts flaming out of control and I'll get on there and then just in a calm, neutral way, provide facts um, straight from the source because I'm dealing with that in a very nice way. Um, it, it just the flame just dies out. It yeah. just the thread just dies and people move <laughs> on. But but that's it's good that you've got knowledgeable people that are engaged because those of us that are biologists and scientists spend all day doing that. We don't want to go home, crank up the computer, and just do that <laughs> for another three hours. So it's really hard. I don't spend a lot of time on those forums because I just I do that during the day. I'm right. not going to do that all night. Yeah. I'd rather write articles at night. Yeah. 
Yeah, you, you've you sent me emails before and I look at the timestamp <laughs> on the email, Jim, and these are three in the morning. Always, yeah. I, I work till two every night. Yeah, what? I work till two and I sleep till eight and then I get in. Because you can be really productive when the whole world is sleeping, that's for sure. <laughs> 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 and actually I got, oh. yeah, I actually got a... Um, I sent an email out. It was only like at one thirty, which isn't even late for me, <laughs> about two weeks ago. And I got an email from a Western director that said, go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, I'm not even done with my monster drink yet. Oh, is that what keeps you going? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, usually. I, I don't do that stuff. I, I, I figure if... If my body is telling me it's time to crash, it's time. I, I don't care where I'm at. I'm, I'm shutting it down. I, I couldn't keep up with you. Yeah. <laughs> so I really enjoy writing and, uh, and enjoy you know doing something extra. Even when I was a regional biologist, I, I just always wanted to do, you know, had interest in collaborating and research and writing magazine articles and being involved in, in things like that. And so I don't know. I'm just driven to do cool stuff and yeah. I enjoy it. So with your science background, and your research and all that you do, how does that help you in your hunting? Yeah, it, it, it helps a lot knowing a lot about the quarry. And, and I was trying to help other people when I wrote, in 2006, I wrote Deer of the Southwest. Right, and um, thank you for that copy. And I, I Oh yeah, I, was, I didn't you even just, ask if you got yeah, that I one. Did. I did, thank you. A copy. Yeah, and so I was writing that and I was thinking, this is gonna help everybody um, be a better deer hunter, help biologists have all this information at their fingertips. And soon after it was published, I had a, I did a book signing at, at Sports and Warehouse in Tucson. And it was like three weeks before Christmas, perfect timing. The book is just out and I'm sitting there with a stack of books and I had this older hunter, he comes up and he flipped through one of the books and he looked through it and he said, there's probably nothing in there I don't already know. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't contain myself. I started laughing. I started laughing because it was just such a funny comment. And I, yeah. I said, you're probably right. You know, yeah. you've hunted a long time. You probably know all this stuff. And he yeah. walked away. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, so, Deer of the Southwest, where can people buy it? Yeah, you know, we were on, I was on your podcast in, in January. And we, I don't know if I told you that. We, we mentioned it. And I said, it, it was, it's out of print. It was being reprinted. It was supposed to be in, in, in April. And then it got extended to May. And then finally, they told me June 30th. But when we were on the podcast, I said, it's being reprinted. It's not available yet. You can't order it off my website yet. But watch for it on DeerNut.com, and, and it'll, it'll pop up when it's available at the end of June. And so I didn't think much of it. And then about two months later, I got an email from a guy that said, hey, I ordered one of your books like a month ago, and I, I didn't get it yet. Can you find out where that is? And I was about to email him back saying, well, you couldn't order it from me because my website shut down, and you know you can't order it through my website. And I went and checked on PayPal, and I had 30 book orders, <laughs> I had 30 book orders waiting for me. <laughs> I, I Somehow I thought my website was disabled, and it wasn't until oh. after to the podcast, a bunch of people were buying books that weren't available yet. So I had to email everybody and apologize. And, and I shut my website down temporarily then and, and told everybody, I'll refund your money now or, you know, I'll fill it when it comes in. And, um, and they eventually came in in June and everybody wanted to just wait. And so I, yeah. I shipped all those out. So um, apparently some people are listening to your podcast. So now they're available. We've got them back in stock at deernut.com. Um, you can get them. They're twenty nine ninety five and um, it, it covers cows, white-tailed deer, and desert mule deer in, in the U.S., the southwestern U.S., and northern Mexico. So I put together just everything I could find on desert mule deer and cows, white-tailed deer, and there really isn't much available in a, in a combined kind of one-stop place yeah. other than that book. So it's been pretty successful. It, first edition sold out. Cool. So deernut.com is your website, and now if people go there... The, the PayPal account is activated and the order is going to show up and Jim's mm -hmm. going to drop it in the mail. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'll actually, yeah, I'll actually have some books to, to mail out. <laughs> and, and also as a bonus, if you don't want to spend anything, I also have um, a link there that's other publications and I've got just a lot of PDFs from magazine articles I've written. So it's categorized by deer and there's another category for quail and another category for pronghorn. Um, and so there's all kinds of magazine articles on things that I've written about over the years. That, so that so you you've just written download. a lot about pronghorn. Well, a couple. Some of those are a couple of those are scientific papers on the on the website. We did some genetics and some disease stuff with pronghorn. And then I've just written um, a handful of magazine articles um, mm -hmm. 
just uh, on, on pronghorn. Outrunning extinction was one of them. Yeah. Talking about 18 different extinct pronghorn um, families that are all extinct except for the pronghorn we know now. And some really? of them had just fantastic horn shapes and horn cores. And it's uh-huh. Really, really an interesting story. People talk about, um, if you want to go down a rabbit hole for a second, people yeah, talk about there was an American cheetah that was in North America. We actually had a cheetah in the Pleistocene. People frequently talk about, well, um, the pronghorn are fast because there was a North American cheetah that chased the pronghorn around and they co-evolved the speed. But the the fossils of the American cheetah show that it just showed up about one to two million years ago in North America before it went extinct. And this pronghorn family has been for 18 million years, this pronghorn, it's a native North American family. There was 18 different kinds of pronghorn with forked horn cores, no with way. spiral horn cores, with all kind with, with three horn cores on both sides, uh, heptomerics, and all kinds of these different bizarre pronghorn. And they're all extinct except for Antilocapra, the one, one pronghorn that we have now. And so I actually, I wrote a, um, a field guide to these extinct pronghorns called the bestiary of ancestral antilocaprids. Cause I like big words. You know? <laughs> never, never use a big word when a diminutive one will do. Uh, and, and so it, so I had an illustrator from, from our agency illustrated the, the skulls of all of these 18 different types. And then I talked about geographically where they were, um, how big they were, what we knew, just what we know about them. one paragraph for each one. Um, but the, huh. but the North American cheetah was was not around 18 million years ago when this pronghorn family developed the speed. If if I could go back 18 million years, I would be happier than when I show up at a Dairy Queen on a yeah. 90 degree day. For big game hunters, the Pleistocene is a place to be. I had no idea there were 18 different spe- mm-hmm. subspecies, whatever. Yeah, types, types. types. You know, at this okay. point, no one really knows. If yeah. They, Probably species because they were so different. Really? So uh, I have every pronghorn book I've ever been able to buy, I buy. Mm-hmm. So, Enerton was the old classic. Arthur Enerton was the old classic one. And uh, Yoakum. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, yep. He's got the one pronghorn ecology and management. That's with uh, Bart O'Gara and yeah. Jim Yoakum both. And they work together on a lot of things. I, I, I met Jim a couple times. I didn't know him that well, but, um, but Bart. I knew Bart pretty well. I I've read that. I, I haven't. I can't because it's thick. It's, oh yeah, it's huge. It's, it's. I have a photograph. I have um, one of the photo credits in there. Oh, I let him use a drawing of a jaw, a pronghorn jaw, for aging purposes. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Really, you can age them just like deer. <laughs> yeah, not as easy as deer. They're harder than deer because the teeth are different. They're hypsodont instead of selenodont. There, you want some big words? Yeah, yeah. I like all <laughs> so, these big words. So, I, I, I'll go and Google them when we're yeah, all there, done. Yeah, it's not important. But it just makes me sound really good. But, you know, <laughs> deer we know pretty well because we've had a lot of captive deer and we, we just kind of know what their age progression looks like in tooth wear, yeah. certainly in replacement the first three years. With pronghorn, someone has developed an, an aging guide and it's more general than deer. It's not as exact, but still it tells you if it's a kind of a two or three or a four or five or a seven or eight. So okay. that's interesting. That's still interesting. Yeah. And up to four years old, you can definitely tell. Um, because different teeth are coming in. And so you can tell mm-hmm. really well up to four years old. And then if you've got an animal that has all its adult teeth, a pronghorn, then you know it's at least four years old. And, and even that's interesting to know, even if you just know that a little bit. Yeah, because I, I, I have a pronghorn. I have issues with pronghorn. I, I, if, if anyone needs treatment for pronghorn <laughs> issues, <laughs> yeah, it's I me. Know. <laughs> and uh, so I read these books and... Yoakum has some other books he's done. I have those. Um, but I re- He's I, done tons of work, probably more than anybody else. Jim Yoakum, he was a BLM biologist. Yeah. And I've, he did a bunch of his studies up here in central Montana. And he bar- lived was, in Lolo, Montana. Okay. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have but, some handwritten letters from him still. He's really? cool. Yeah, but cool guy. some of them are from the 50s and they're doing oh, yeah. sagebrush removal and uh, testing. And they're doing mm-hmm. transects of that. And yep. you read it, it's like, wow, this is really interesting. Those stuff. guys got out in the field and they did stuff, physical research. Yeah. They didn't sit at their computers and put GIS layers together. Not that that's a bad thing because that's what we're going to be doing the next few days. <laughs> but, but still, they were like field men. They were out there measuring brush and, and weighing animals and pulling guts out and looking at stuff. Yeah. So you, you hunt a lot of meal there. 
I do. Yeah, my I prefer mule deer. I I grew up in Wisconsin um, through my bachelor's degree and hunted Whitetail, Wisconsin, and then went to uh, uh, went to the Southwest and saw. I went to Texas first, and then managed trophy whitetails where you know bucks were 150 to 180. We went to Crockett on a, on a ranch in Texas, and then came to Arizona and saw these little cows whitetail, and eh, not so excited about those. And now everybody's going to kill me, the cows whitetail fans. Yeah. And then and then I saw a desert mule deer, and I said, now there's a deer. I used to on the bottom of my emails hey, have Venado de Dios, God's deer for mule deer. Oh, really? <laughs> so the so mule deer is really my interest. So I, I hunt, I've hunt, I've hunted cow's white tail quite a bit earlier. I prefer to hunt mule deer now. Yeah. And is it significantly different hunting them in the yeah. desert than it is? Yeah, it is. In... Yeah, mule deer are, are, I have to admit, easier. You know, cow's white tail, rugged stuff. Bigger bucks are up in some nasty things. You gotta, you've got to work for them. You've got to be way sneakier. Mule deer, a lot of times, will give you an extra, an extra look back. If you, if you flush them, they'll bound a couple times, stop, and look back. And if you're ready, that gives you another opportunity, which is really good for people that need a little extra time getting in position. Some of the ardent cow's whitetail hunters that I work with in the Arizona Game and Fish would sometimes tell me, when are you going to take the training wheels off and hunt cow's whitetail? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't care. I love mule deer. It's fun hunting them. Well, it's interesting to think about how certain species and i i can't i get asked all the time where does your passion for antelope come from i can't really explain mm-hmm. it exactly and i know some people who are fanatic elk hunters fanatic and it's that that really gets them wound up mm-hmm. and for you it's pronghorn are so unique i you know i've always been deer person deer person and i, I came to arizona and i got a, a pronghorn tag the second year which is really unusual Whoa. yeah Second year I applied, I got a pronghorn tag, and I didn't know anything about pronghorn. So I got a couple pronghorn books, and I read about their biology and, and their their mating behavior and just everything, breeding behavior, and I read a little bit about their evolution at the time, and I was fascinated. These things are, they're not just like different colored deer or different looking deer. They have this long evolutionary history in North America. They have these eye sockets way up at the base of the, the horn cores there, and then their, their behavior is, in some cases, really weird. Very weird. And I was just, I, I became, they're my second favorite other than the deer. Pronghorn is uh, definitely a second because they're really unique. They're really cool animals. Yeah. I think the, the whole evolutionary thing about how many different pronghorn we had is one thing that really captures me. I've always liked Ice Age animals and Pleistocene animals and, and the whole history of the pronghorn is so interesting. Huh. So Val Geist, I have one of his mule deer books and he kind of wraps it up by asking the question i can't say that he necessarily prognosticates this but asks if the mule deer can survive mm-hmm. are, are right. they, is have you read that yes oh yeah he wrote he wrote an article on outdoor life too and val's a, a friend of mine he sent me an email last week and so we correspond and and but i've i've told him and i've told others and i've written about it that that the idea that mule deer are, are not going to survive, that white tails are going to take them over. He has said in the past that hybridization is going to accelerate the disappearance of the mule deer, and there just isn't that evidence of that. Hybridization is, occurs at a very low level. Those species stay apart very well. Um, mule deer has just a completely different west-wide niche, and if we do what we're doing to preserve the habitats and the wide open spaces for mule deer, they're not, they're not doomed. They're not on the way out. I've written at least one article that said that was titled, Is the Mule Deer Doomed? Yeah. Uh, so I'm familiar with that, that discussion. I love Val, but it's, it's not true. They're not, they're not doomed. They're just another big game animal that we're working to conserve. Yeah. What are the biggest challenges for mule deer? Because it, when you read mule deer reports across the West, it's not as uh, optimistic as it is for the elk reports. Mm-hmm, right. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it's hard to get Western agency directors really interested in elk conservation right now because elk are doing pretty well compared to some of the other species. So mule deer, some of the stresses on mule deer, one of the things that, that people have to understand is that it's all they're all different things depending on where you are in the range of mule deer. And, and we very soon in, in the mule deer working group history recognized that different eco-regions around North America, mule deer populations were reacting in, in to very different stresses and very different things. And so one of the first things we did is we took mule deer range and we divided it into seven different eco-regions. And so a lot of what we've done has been by eco-region because 
Mulder in those ecoregions kind of have a lot of similarities and differences from other ecoregions. So one of the products we have is a, a series of seven Mulder habitat guidelines of what Mulder need to improve their habitat. And we did that with seven in seven one for each ecoregion uh, because the coastal rainforest, the blacktails and the coastal rainforest have very different habitat needs than Intermountain West. And so, yeah. and so when people say, what, what's impacting mule deer? Um, it depends really where you are. In the Northern Rocky Mountains, winter kill is a big deal. In the Southwest, it's, it's water availability and just drought. Um, in Intermountain West, uh, invasive species and increased fire cycles is a big thing. Um, and so that's why you rarely, except in the 90s, when you had mule deer populations kind of all declining or most of them declining, you rarely get mule deer populations all throughout the range declining or increasing. They're doing different things in different areas because they're responding to different environmental pressures. Huh. Well, I have, this has been, this is my mule deer year. I have more mule deer tags than I have pronghorn tags this year. <laughs> that's a flip. I, that's, that's a flip. A, that's a different, I, huh? I have... Uh, uh, here, right, just right out when you walk out the hotel here and look north, you'll see the Bridger Range. Mm -hmm. I have that limited entry tag here in Montana, and then I have a late uh, archery on in the plains of Colorado. So uh, it's very when you're talking about uh, ecosystem types or however whatever term you use there, you get to play in a couple of them. Yeah, I there how I'm gonna hunt them in. 9,500 feet in the Bridger Range is way different than how I'm going to hunt them almost on the Kansas border. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yep. So, so the biologists have, have always tried to focus a lot of what we do on, on thinking about doing it. And, and the advantage of that, too, is that we're not thinking state by state. Montana does it this way. Idaho does it that way. But the collection of states in that ecoregion are all kind of thinking the same way and managing and facing the same issues. And, and that just makes much more sense from a conservation standpoint. So uh, mule deer is one of the places where you hear, uh, I don't want to, I'm going to say this, but I'm not informed enough to know for sure if this is the case, but at times it seems like managers almost are throwing a Hail Mary pass to respond to some of the pressures hunters are putting on them. We want older deer, or we want more deer, or we want this. So you see things like four-point or better rules. You, you see all kinds of things mm -hmm. to try to get more mature bucks through the tube. Is there any of them that work or don't work short of just... Antler Low. point restrictions in the West have not worked. Some of the Eastern white tail guys are, are happy with them for, for different reasons, but um, just number of points, four point better, three point or better, universally throughout the West is not working um, very well. And I think British Columbia is an exception. I think they're happy with it. But in most cases, agencies have tried it under pressure of, uh, of hunters thinking that it's going to make, it's going to, make that age class a little older and then they've abandoned it because what's happened with a four point or better is that every animal even some of the young animals that get four points they get they get whacked right away everybody's out there and they can't shoot anything so they stay out in the field and then just about every four point buck gets taken out of the field and so you're truncating that or age structure at like three or four as soon as they get four point or better you're not really making that age class you're not really getting these six and seven year olds because they're all all that hunt pressure is focused on the very class of animals that you're trying to make more of mm -hmm. with that so so in functionally it seems like a good idea but it, it really doesn't work to to make that age structure older you really just need to kill less animals throughout the the, uh, throughout the time period when they're younger and let more animals reach those older age classes. And that's how you get that older, older age structure. And you can do that by managing total entry if you've got a permitted system, or if you don't, then you're, you're stuck with season length and other things to do. Yeah, because in Montana, we are the only state I know that hunts our general mule deer season with a rifle in the rut of November. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And... Uh, yeah, so you've got yeah. to compensate with higher hunt success that way. You've got to compensate in, in other ways to keep the, the harvest level appropriate. Right. Um, because the, a friend of mine says, if it wasn't for the private land sanctuaries of eastern Montana, there wouldn't be a deer, a buck <laughs> over a year and a half old. <laughs> and we, we all chuckle just like you did when he says it, but there's some there, truth to that. It, it creates a different type of 
I'll call sanctuary or protection. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, yeah, agencies struggle. And and actually one of the fact sheets that we just completed, I think we just threw it up on the website, is this balance that agencies have to do between managing for mature bucks or managing for opportunity. Because everybody wants to go out and hunt and every year and they want to go out to their favorite area um, and, and they want the opportunity to hunt. And then everybody also wants to kill big bucks. In fact, Justin Shannon, the, the now the game chief, now the, the wildlife chief in Utah, once said that they surveyed their 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 hunters one time in Utah and they said, Do you would you rather have more bucks or would you rather have big bucks? And the majority of the answers were that people wanted more big bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and that's and that's the that's the honest truth is that right. people don't understand that it's a trade off. We you can have more bucks and more opportunity and be able to go to your favorite area every year with your family and your friends and have a good time and hunt. Uh, we can also manage it so that you can't go every year and you may not be able to go to your favorite area, but when you go, there's not that many hunters out there and there's this older age structure and there's big bucks out there. And so agencies can't do both. And so what they try to do is offer opportunity throughout most of the state and then have some of these areas that have restricted harvests, older age classes, lower density of hunters and for people that want that experience. So you, so people have the opportunity to apply for those, not go hunting except for once every four years, but when they do, it's that kind of hunt or just go with their family and friends in some other area. And so agencies have to walk that line and try to provide a diversity of hunting opportunities for everybody. And it's not easy. Yeah. You would know from your experience. Yes. And and most of the people coming to public meetings and complaining about how we're hunting deer and getting on forums and complaining uh, are not the people that want more opportunity and want to go hunting with family and friends. They're people that want big bucks. Right. So the big buck people are, are much more vocal and they, they, they appear in the chatter disproportionately from the average person that's not engaged. They just, just give me a deer tag. I just want to go out. Right. Um, I'm not going to get on a forum. I'm not going to come to a public meeting. I'm not going to write a letter to the director. I just want a deer tag. And you don't hear from those people as much as you hear from people who are really passionate about big bucks. Yeah. Well, uh, if you want to get beat up in Montana, just go to a bar and say we should move our mule deer hunting out of the rut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, that, and, and if, that's, if that's what a majority of the hunters want, that's what state agencies do is that we manage the public's wildlife for the public. Right. And, and if the majority of people want it one way, it can keep coming up in discussion. And the minority is always frustrated because it keeps coming up and never gets changed. But if that's what the majority want, then that's what the majority of the hunt areas are probably going to be. Yeah. Well, meal there, uh, you know, I like you, I grew up in the upper Midwest in Minnesota as a whitetail hunter. Moving out West, I remember the first meal deer I shot in Nevada. I was going to college there. It was just a little spike, but I was like, oh, look at this, man. That's really cool. It's a mule deer. Yeah, and and, and it had these great big floppy ears, looked like Dumbo. Mm -hmm. And then the next year I applied and I drew one of the late November really hard to draw tags over by Ely. And I go over there and I toast the first four point I see. <laughs> I think so I've excited. shot a world record out, uh, deer. I get it in the back of my truck. I drive into Ely. There's a sporting goods store. It's still there. I'm trying to remember what the name of it is. Uh, but anyhow, I'm parked out in front of that. I, I'm going to do a little showing off. <laughs> And it's about a, I don't know, 23, 24 inch wide buck. It was so old, it had no teeth left. It was, I think he <laughs> just uh, sacrificed himself and said, I, I can't make another winner. And I was uh, actually a guy come out of the store and he's like, oh, you got deer? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking he's going to go, whoa, that's a big one. He's like, oh, that's pretty nice. And he walks away. I'm like, well, what, what the hell, man? That, that's a big deer. Well, then along comes this other truck parks right behind me young kid jumps out and this is a big deer i mean the rack laying on its side you can see the Mm -hmm. antlers above the box of the truck and now he's got a crowd around that truck and i looked at him like oh that's how big meal deer get oh they have those yeah i jumped in my truck and i drove back home to carson (laughs) city i'm like all right but (laughs) when i was new in arizona i worked the kaibab check station during one of the late hunts when they really kill the big bucks coming off the the east side and and i wasn't very many years in arizona so i hadn't seen a lot of 
definitely not Rocky Mountain Mule Deer up there at the, the northern end. And I was in the check station and truck pulled in and the old biologist had been there for years, looked out. He goes, oh, we got another deer. And he slogged out there really bored. And I looked out the window and I thought they were collecting firewood. I thought they, I thought they had the bed of the truck full of firewood and it was just gigantic, eight by eight Ooh. mule deer like I've never seen before. Just wow. incredible to see a big mule deer like that compared mm. to the desert mule deer we've been seeing. Yeah. Well, I had the Kaibab tag last year, the mm-hmm. early hunt. Mm-hmm. It was in the 80s with the full moon in yeah. the first week in November. Mm-hmm. I didn't see any of those deer that yeah. looked like they had firewood on their it's, head. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard in those early hunts regardless to see those bigger bucks. They come out of the woodwork later for sure. Do they? Because They're what? there because they come out later, but it's hard in those earlier hunts. My son has enough points that in your Arizona draw where you get 20% of the point. Mm-hmm. Uh, tags go to the max point holders. He's got enough that he can draw one of those late muzzleloader hunts on the oh. Kaibab. Are those good hunts? Yeah. Oh, yeah. In in that time period, and you hope you get a big snowstorm that funnels them all down during your hunt. Yeah. And then you sit down and you pick out which four by four you want. Coming no way. <laughs> if you time it right, if you get it right. But yeah. you don't have a lot of control over that. Well, he'll probably draw it after burning his 17 or 18 points, and it'll be bluebird yeah. weather again. Mm-hmm. Yep, uh, yep. Well, I, I'm one of those guys who wants it both ways. Mm-hmm. I, I like being able to hunt them anytime, anywhere in Montana. Yep. And then I just apply for these limited entry permits in Colorado and Arizona and Nevada mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. everywhere else. So, you can do that too, right? I'm, I'm pretty spoiled. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know people that, that apply for only the December cows, whitetail hunts during the rut, and they, they don't go hunting you know, two years in a row, three years in a row, and they don't care. I mean, and, and some of those are applying other places, so they get other hunting in New Mexico. Some of them not. They just, they would rather hunt every few years, and when they get a tag, have it be one of those and really enjoy it. I, I'm, 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 no, not, I'm, I'm not that I'm way. the antithesis of that person. Right. I grew up with four <laughs> boys that I had to feed venison to, so it was always, oh, really? yeah, it was how, always. How old are your boys? The oldest one's 25, and the youngest one's 15. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Man, I only had one. He's 28. <laughs> I, I, I was lazy. I, I, I couldn't, even, I couldn't yeah. even raise a family. I've been called an overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well I'm, I'm always interested because every time we talk to him, you've got so much information. I feel like you need to have your own podcast. Yeah, if yeah, you yeah. wouldn't stay up and write all night long and, that's and true. you did a podcast... I, ha- I don't you, know you, if my website still has that, but I started a WordPress site I and know. I actually had a link on my deernut.com that said press here for Deer Nut Podcast because I intended to do that. I thought I have so much deer content. I could just, I could go on forever yeah. with podcasts. And then I decided, you know, I, I've got more writing that I can possibly do, magazine writing, and the podcast would take a bunch of time and I just don't, I'd rather write then then divert, divert my time to podcasting so okay i just so, abandoned it so how many people read your articles i don't know that's an interesting question because i get very little feedback about my articles once in a while someone will send me an email that says hey i really enjoyed your article but it's almost cricket so i think people hate it i uh, think i think i've been writing for 20 the, years the, the, and i don't really realize that people hate my writing no it's not they hate your writing it's a societal <laughs> trend people are reading less so you need you that need could be. you need your articles to be on audible i know on that's amazon true. yep or yep. you need to just do it as a podcast mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's ridiculous how many people listen to podcasts if, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts if people knew do. what little i know about anything Mm-hmm. No one would listen to my podcast. <laughs> if they knew yeah. how full of BS I am and how I just make it up as I go, they, they'd be like, why? That was, that's, what makes you, that's what makes you approachable and relatable, though, because everybody makes it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, but I have trouble catching up and staying up on, um, on the video stuff because I'm not yeah. in a place where I can sit and watch a video, but I'm driving, I'm working, I'm doing other things. I can yeah. listen to podcasts, but like the Onyx, um, the e-scouting thing, I think I'm on number two. I just haven't, yeah. I haven't been able to get through the rest of that, but that's really cool. I mean, I love that. I just, I can't right. sit there and watch videos for a long time. Uh-huh. I've got other things going on. You're too busy writing articles at three a lot in the morning. That's a lot of it. Yep. Yeah. So if you, if, if, the commissioners or the, the directors of all the Western states came to you and said, Jim, you can have any tag you want. What would you, what would you pick? Hmm. 
in North America? Because I want to kill a roe deer. A roe deer. <laughs> no, it's, it's got to be in North America. <laughs> it's got to be yeah. in the United States, yeah. in the lower 48. Hmm. I think it would just have to be... It would have to be a limited entry, just a mule deer unit, just one with monsters. Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. and and I don't know because I don't hunt the western states. I with four boys, we just I had kind of hunts back to back in Arizona with different yeah. kids, and then right. my niece um, started hunting, and and uh, my sister's a um, a single mom, and so I would I always took niece out hunting, and so yeah. I'd always have different combinations of me and my dad and this son, and then a junior hunt with these two kids, and then another junior hunt with this son and my niece, and that sort yeah. of thing. So cool. I was so busy with hunts, I don't I don't know any any of the Western units to say, oh, I'd want Montana, you yeah. know, number so and so. I don't okay. know, but but one of these limited entry Rocky Mountain mule deer, it'd be a mule deer hunt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I have in two weeks, I leave for an archery bison hunt on. The Henry Mountain. Oh, wow. Southern that's Utah. right. You said you had that. Everyone mm-hmm. told me I'm going to be distracted by the large mule oh, deer yeah. that I'm going to oh, see yeah. there. Henry Mountains is incredible. Yeah. It, and that's a classic example of ratcheting down opportunity to mm-hmm. a very, very oh, you bet. extreme level mm-hmm. to get the outcome of very, very mm-hmm. old deer. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Nah. We had a commission meeting once talking about uh, the Arizona Strip, I means 13A, 13B, and, and the Kaibab, which is 12A and 12B, and, and there was some concern there wasn't enough mature bucks up there, and our big game supervisor at the time had a slide up there with about 12 photos of, of big mature 4x4 four four bucks up there, and, and it kind of illustrating, this is from the surveys this year, and one of the commissioners said, I don't see a good buck up there. <laughs> really? and his point was and he said verbally i want bucks dying of old age up there that way i know we're maximizing antler size and we're not killing them too soon really and so wow. you know and, and that's the that's direction from the commission huh which which is who we take direction from right <laughs> well i had the 13a tag in arizona in 2007 but that tag is still in my drawer is it really yeah oh. It was the notorious drought year the next year. Yeah. It's uh, not guaranteed though. I mean people the people desire that and desire that and they finally get it and it's not always it doesn't always come up. It's a it's tough successful. hunt. Mm-hmm. It, it is I even hired an outfitter. Mm-hmm. A, a friend of mine, Kurt Rood, had the tag the year before and he is he kills more big mule deer in places that aren't supposed to have big mule deer than anyone I know. Mm-hmm. And you can when, find him. when he came back from that hunt, he told me he said you know if i had that hunt again i'd hire breck bundy as my outfitter <laughs> and yeah, lo and behold I, I pulled the tag the next year i call kurt i'm like are you serious, yeah, were you serious about yeah, that? he said randy i know this is kind of going against your grain but trust me on this and i trust kurt enough that i called breck and i hunted with him and it was the best decision mm-hmm. he could have made in that country 13a has such low deer yeah, densities it does it's it, it's just oh and we hunted yeah. hard. We hunted from daylight to dark every day of the season. And I'll tell you, it was one of the funnest hunts I've ever had, though. <laughs> really? We saw a lot, not a lot of deer, but we saw some decent deer. Mm-hmm. But it's just a cool place. Yeah, it is pretty spectacular. I know someone that had an archery tag up there and just accidentally, fortuitously ran into a Bundy. And I'm not sure if it was the same one because they okay. had that land up there. Yeah. And he helped them out and he ended up arrowing a pretty nice buck. Oh, there. really? Yeah. yeah, so he wasn't like being guided, but they let him into this one area that might have been private land. Oh, um, to go ahead and, and hunt some uh, bucks that were coming in. Well, I, I this year I'm I'm excited about mule deer. That's why I'm picking mm-hmm. your brain on all this stuff. So you should be excited in, about mule in, deer. <laughs> I'm hunting them here in Montana, November 10th through the 15th which will be good rutting activity. And then I'm hunting them out in the plains of Colorado November 25th through the 30th, which will be good rutting activity. Mm -hmm. Mm. So I'm... Good reason to be excited. Yeah. But if it's like... I've had this Bridger tag three previous times and I just go up there and I watch them. (laughs) I've never... I've ended up filling a whitetail tag the three previous times I had that male deer tag. Because, I, and this is probably foolish, but I go there and I'm, I see a four and a half year old buck and I'm looking at him. I'm like, oh man, if he just had another year or two. <laughs> and so I keep letting him go and letting him go. And then it gets towards the end of the season. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go shoot a whitetail. <laughs> and so I do that. So I don't know. Maybe I have a problem with this. I, uh, 
uh, I, have a commitment I, issue yeah, <laughs> with I, meal deer. I, I've got three Bridger buck tags I've never filled. I've got a Kaibab early rifle deer tag I didn't fill. I have an Arizona strip mule deer tag I didn't fill. Mm-hmm. I don't have a very good track record, Jim. Yeah, he... <laughs> <laughs> I think there's an issue there. I think there's some kind of barrier. Maybe. I'm not sure how I'm going to get beyond You feel like that. you're cheating on pronghorn if you uh, cheat well, on maybe, deer? Well, maybe that's it. Maybe I, I don't want the pronghorn to to think that I'm... You don't, can't, you don't love them anymore. Yeah, maybe that's it. No, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be giving the pronghorn a lot of love next week. Yep. I, I, this is weird, but... I find myself driving down the road, the, like coming home from New Mexico last week. I'm driving down the road and the, I look over the camera crew, they're sleeping because it's late at night. And I'm thinking about pronghorn so much. I don't remember the last 50 miles that I just drove <laughs> towing a trailer with four llamas in it. That's that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, that is. That's like a blackout. Yeah. It's like blacking out. It's like, how how did it get to be midnight? <laughs> I, it was just ten thirty. <laughs> but so now these are these are rabbit holes that have yeah, nothing yep. to do with anything. But uh, for for uh, someone who's a a mule deer uh, passionate mule deer, not just hunter, but in your your life of work, uh, it's fun to talk about mm-hmm. those kind of things with people who really know their stuff. And, uh, Fun to talk about anybody that's interested in meal deer. Yeah, passionate about meal deer, and there's yeah. plenty of us. So, uh, do you guys have the cheatgrass issue in Arizona? Only like, in the northern part of the Kaibab, the west side of the Kaibab, the winter range is getting invaded by cheatgrass. Yeah. Uh, but it's really just that northern, that northern edge of Arizona. It's not a big issue. But as you get down to the Sonoran Desert, we've got red brome, which is just another grass that wasn't in the Sonoran Desert, and that it has encroached a little bit, and then it dries out. Same story burns and then it comes back thicker and then it burns so you get this increased fire cycle in the Sonoran Desert and you talk about recovering after a fire you've got 700 year old saguaros how long does it take to regenerate a 700 year old saguaro when it's burned wow. so so you've got red brome in some of these areas that, that commence we've got and we've got layman's love grass we've got some other invasives cheat grass is, is, is really destructive because of what it's done in the sagebrush ecosystem but there's insidious other issues with invasive species too yeah is that red brome? Does it have any wildlife nutritional value? And when it's like a lot of those, when it's when it's just growing up, you know, anything that's brand new and tender, most most things will eat it. You know, yeah. even if they're mostly browsers, like deer, pronghorn, less than less than ten percent of their diet's grass. And so sometimes you hear ranchers complain about, yeah, you've got too many pronghorn. There's too many pronghorn on my rangeland, and they're out there eating all that grass. They're really eating the weeds and some of the shrubs in between the grass. They're not eating large amounts of grass except right when it comes up when it's tender then the pronghorn will be eating grass, just like cattle. But after the first couple of weeks, then they're eating the forbs that come up, the broadleaf things. Yeah. So in Arizona, you guys have, I, I might be saying this wrong, cliff rose? Mm-hmm. Cliff rose, yeah. That's one yeah. of the winter browse species up in the Kaibab. Yeah. And in unit nine and unit mm-hmm. 10, when I find that stuff when I'm elk hunting, the elk love that stuff yeah, too. Yeah, sure. And then when I go to Nevada... And I've I've been lucky to draw some really cool tags in Nevada. That mountain mahogany. Are oh they, yeah, are they eating that mountain mahogany? Is that? Oh yeah, mountain it... mountain mahogany. Circle carpus is well, nobody cares about what the genus name is, but mountain mahogany throughout the West, wherever you find mountain mahogany, you'll you'll find mule deer there. I mean that if you had to pick one plant, that's probably it. That that's like a universal food that is always going to hold deer and, and give nutrition to deer. Mount Mahogany is awesome. A year round or mostly in the... No, just winter. mostly mostly in the... Well, in the, in the winter too. I mean, that's a, that's a winter browse where they hit the twigs and, and what leaves are there and, and when they're, they're deciduous. Yeah, because it, in, when I find it in Nevada... I'm locked in. That, I'm, yeah. I'm, you're not getting me off that rock mm-hmm. that overlooks that ridge full right. of mountain mahogany. Yeah, if you've got a slope, and the whole side of that slope's mountain mahogany. You need to be set up watching that, if it's, if, unless it's just widespread, it's everywhere. But if you've got kind of a unique situation where you've got a cluster of mountain mahogany, oh man, they're going to be there. It's yeah. going to be a magnet for them. Huh. And they're going to be bedded in that, and then they're going to get up and feed a little bit and get back down. So. Some of those big sage basins of, say, Wyoming, some of the places of western Colorado, the Great Basin states, what is the primary forage for for meal deer in a place like that? Is it sage? In, they do eat sage in the winter, and you know, sage isn't the greatest thing. If they had a big selection of different foods to eat, 
say you wouldn't be the first one, but in the winter, that offers nutrition. It's there and it's abundant. So a lot of these winter range, a lot of these deer on winter range, they're subsisting mostly on sage. Yeah. And just because it's it's the best thing that's available to them, it's not necessarily, it's not something they would eat in the summertime. Okay. For sure. So, but, the, it, but it is keeping, it is keeping them to survive through the winter. We, we, a major component. we were up doing that, uh, Sitka blacktail hunt with, uh, Jim Bagetail, uh, who, you know, uh, and we had, a, a researcher professor, Sophie Gilbert on that I know hunt Sophie. with us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she used the term that at a certain point, every deer is just seeing how slowly it can starve to death. <laughs> That's right. Yep. It, is that kind of how it is? For yeah, absolutely. Also, there was a paper, I think, in the 60s by Motz, a guy named Motz. And he, it was about the, I forgot the title. The title contained the term slippery slope because he talked about deer feeding and feeding and feeding in the summer and the fall and getting their fat reserves. And they're like on the top of the slope. And then she may have even described this. And she, I don't know if she talked about the slope um, from that paper, but throughout the winter, then they're sliding down the slope and, and they hope that they start with enough, high enough up on the slope, which means with enough fat at the beginning of the winter that they, they don't slide all the way off the edge of the slope at the end. They still have enough fat where they stay on that slope till it greens up again. Yeah. And so he used that analogy of coming off the slippery slope, but definitely they stock up on fat. They go down to winter range and they just try to survive through winter range. And throughout winter range, they're losing fat reserves and losing fat reserves. And you hope that the green up comes early enough that they can get off of that winter range and start moving up to summer range and get and follow that green wave as they talk about up up the slope. Yeah. So it's a matter of I only want to starve to death at a certain pace. <laughs> Yeah. Otherwise, it's terminal. Yeah, right. If you starve to death too fast at a faster pace, then you're not going to make it. But it's when they go to winter range, they're trying to retain as much winter fat um, and just trying to because they're they're eating that nutrition. But the sage is just a maintenance, just to keep them alive, and they're losing weight throughout that winter, and they just got to get off that winter range as fast as possible. And that's why kind of harsh winters that linger on into the spring can yeah. be really bad because it keeps them down there when they really need to be moving up slope following yeah. the green stuff. So in the West, you can't talk about any type of big game animal without discussing predators. So what, yeah, as people really, like to discuss them a lot. Yeah. And the what I've found is the people who know the least about them seem to be <laughs> the ones who want to talk about them the most. Yeah. Is that, am I the... No, uh, that is true. Okay. Yeah, I, I is just true. At know. least they talk the loudest. R- exactly. Yeah. Uh, that, that's been my experience. <laughs> and I, I claim to know just about nothing about it. But I'm glad to hear that this mealdeerworkinggroup.com has papers mm-hmm. on predation. Right. Because we will hear it time and time again. All the lions are killing them all. Mm-hmm. The coyotes are killing them all. The wolves are killing them all. Yep. It, it, yeah, uh, the, we have, I mentioned that fact sheet on predation, but we also, one of the first things we did when we got together as a, a meal deer working group is we were trying to, trying to look at things that were impacting deer populations and we ranked some of the things that were impacting mule deer throughout the West. Uh, Predators wasn't the number one thing, but there was so much talk about that because mule deer populations were low. One of the first things we did is we wrote a, a paper that was published in Wildlife Society Bulletin, and that's on the website as a PDF, so people can go and, and read that. But we, we wrote this paper where we pulled together all of the other research that's been done with predators and mule deer and black-tailed deer. There's been so much done with with whitetails and coyotes and, and stuff, but we ignored that for the most part, except where we needed to refer to some of it. And we pulled together all the mule deer literature and predators and put it together. And this was in, in 1999 or 2000, it was published. So it was, it was a while ago now, and there's a lot of good research that's been done since. And we pulled that together and we kind of summarized in cases where people did predator control, what were the most success, what, what were the things that resulted in, in a successful result, which means helping the deer population out. And if you're going to try to do any predator control to help deer populations, a couple things are important. One thing is it has to be timed appropriately. If you're talking about coyote predation on mule deer fawns, you, you don't kill them. You don't go out there and kill coyotes in, in like August and September. You, you go out and you hit them, the coyote population, right before the fawn drop, like the month before the fawn drop. April. So that's one. They go out and hunt coyotes in April. Yes, yeah, yeah. right, right before okay. that. And number two, and this relates to 
um, telling people to go out and hunt coyotes. Number two is you've got to hit them hard. You've got to hit the predator population hard. You can't go out and, and just have individuals go out and call a couple coyotes in in a game management unit and, and think that you're doing anything good for deer populations. You've got to hammer them. You've got to drastically reduce that coyote population 50 to 70 percent before you're really going to have any impact on really the number of fawns that make it through that year. And so you have to do it. It has to be timed appropriately. It has to be super intensive and, and it has to be in concentrated in an area. You, you couldn't, it would be so expensive to kill enough coyotes in one game management unit. You spend so many tens of probably hundreds of thousands of dollars doing that with aerial gunning and with trap, paying people to trap and all that, that you could spend that money on some habitat work that would be much more long lasting than just a boost in, in, the number of fawns that survive that one year because the next year the coyote population is going to be right back up right. i did that for my graduate work in south texas i killed all the coyotes out of a ten thousand acre area for six months and then left it for six months and when i came back for the second season um uh, to kill coyotes for another six months the the coyote population was right back to where it was when i started so really and so that's why the timing <laughs> is important you, you can hammer and i'm talking about almost every single coyote in South Texas brush country being eliminated from 10,000 acres. And six months later, they were all back. And so it has to be timed right before when you need that, that reduction in predation. It has to be intensive. It has to be focused. And, and so when you look at, well, what's the state agency going to do at a statewide level or even at a game management unit level, it would take an awful lot of money to reduce coyotes enough to, to actually improve the deer population, to increase the deer population. And then it's just a temporary effect. Yeah. Then when it comes to lions, you can hammer lions very intensively um, in, in an area, and you can relax the adult um, doe harvest, but it's a matter of, of the amount of money that it takes and how long-lasting is that effect going to be. It's going gonna, it's gonna to reduce the predation pressure on adult deer for a year. Right. And then those mountain lion populations the same way are going to be right back. So in, in my deer book, I'm, I have a, a chapter on predation or a chapter on mortality and a big section on predation where I talk about, we need to first talk about are predators impacting deer populations? It, they may not be. It may in that area for that year, it may be environmental, it may be drought, it may be other things. If predators are impacting deer populations, is there anything we can do about it? I mean, can do we have enough money to kill enough predators to really do something about it? And if, if there is something we can do about it, then the third thing is, should we do something about it? Because it comes at a great social cost from hunters going out there saying, hey, we want more deer. We're going to hammer, the, we're going to kill every coyote, every mountain lion in this area so we can have more deer. We need to be careful as hunters on how these things look to the non-hunting public because there's 92% of the public that doesn't hunt. And if they don't see us as positive forces in conservation, if they see us as people who don't like any competitors for the deer that we kill and we're just going to kill predators, we do have to be aware of how that looks to the general public. We want them to see us as, as being conservationists and, and really concerned about conservation, not concerned about who's competing for my deer hunt sort yeah. of thing. Well, in the elk world that I operate in, uh, being on the board of a national group that focuses on elk, we've tried to gather as much information as we can about predation's effect on elk. And one, one thing that holds true across every place that the studies have been done is that predation effects are amplified when habitat quality is impaired. Yeah, they're, they're, in, they're so closely entwined, habitat and, and predation, certainly. Yeah, because there's, if you've got, uh, like for an example, if you're talking about pronghorn populations and, and coyotes, you think, well, we're going to kill some coyotes and we're going to increase the pronghorn fawn survival in there. If it's a drought year and everything's dry, you can remove all the coyotes and those fawns hit the ground and the fawns are underweight. There's no cover for them. The does aren't producing very much milk because they don't have good nutrition. And the and the the uh, and so th those things hit the ground, no cover. They're underweight already. They're at a great disadvantage, and most of those are going to die anyway, just because of the drought right. year. So you did all the predator control, and you really aren't going to see much. And we've shown this through research over and over. You have to have really good habitat conditions that can support more animals. And so if you've got a really wet year and you've got a bunch of grass, the does have good nutrition to produce a lot of milk. The fawns are born heavy. They hit the ground. They've got a lot of cover. The coyotes that are running around have full bellies because there's a lot of rabbits and rodents that year because of all the rain. Just everything is, is aligned 
aligned. And, and those years when you do predator control and save those fawns from predation, they're going to live because the habitat allows them to live. And so the, you can't talk about predator control without talking about what the habitat conditions are. They're, they're just, they're, they're both together. Yeah. Well, as a guy who is in charge of Arizona's Mexican wolf, uh, program. Do you even want to go there? They are predators, sure. Yeah, I love talking about <laughs> wolves. People usually can't turn this picket off when we start talking about oh, wolves. <laughs> well, you guys have an interesting dynamic going on there. Uh, we do. I, we, I've followed it very closely just because I've been very involved in how it unfolded up here in the Northern Rockies. Right? And I want to see if you guys can end up getting a better deal out of it than we mm-hmm. did. Yeah, and what happened in the Northern Rockies has, has certainly resonated and, and impacted what we've done with Mexican wolves because everybody familiar with what happened in the Northern Rockies where they, they said, okay, recovery criteria, which is when we take them off the endangered species uh, list and they won't be endangered anymore and state agencies will manage wolves. And that point will be basically, they first said, if we have three populations of 100 wolves, consisting of 10, um, breeding, 10 pairs. breeding pairs. And then shortly after that, it was switched to three populations of 150. So that was the, that was the threshold. We need to get the three populations of 150, um, so which is 450 wolves. And so we were at, I think, 1,700 wolves, and they still weren't delisted. Right. And it took an act of Congress to get them delisted because um, some, some uh, environmental groups just kept suing to keep them on the Endangered Species Act, uh, on the Endangered Species List. But the, the endangered species list is supposed to be like the emergency room. It's like animals that are in danger of becoming extinct. We put them on the endangered species list. It's like putting them in the emergency room, and we do everything we can to keep them from dying, keep them from going extinct. And, and as soon as we get them to the point where they're increasing, they're doing pretty well, and we get them over this threshold of, say, three times uh, 150, then they get taken off the endangered species list, turned over to the states for management. It's like taking a, a patient out of the, the emergency room and putting them into the hospital for care or, or sending them home under the care of their, their primary care physician. And, and people, there's some groups that, that want to keep wolves in the emergency room forever. They right. just want to protect them forever and use all our resources. And that's not fair to the hundreds of other endangered species that need our help and need our money. And when we have, um, there's like about 5,000 wolves in the Western Great Lakes. There's, I, I just heard recently there's almost 2,000 wolves in the Northern Rockies. Yeah. When you're at those levels, you're not in the emergency room anymore. No. I mean, it's way past the time to take them off the Endangered Species Act, turn their management over to the states, but there's some individuals and groups that can't stand the thought of a wolf dying at the hands of a human, and that's what's driving most of these lawsuits. It's not ecological. It's not whether they're really in danger of extinction or not. It's just personal issues with wolves being hunted and wolves, wolves you're, dying. You're way more generous than I am. I know, I know, I, but I, the, the realm I work with, I work with everybody. Right. <laughs> so, since we talk in terms so of you, You're neutral. very polite. <laughs> I say the reason that it happens is because the wolf is really not a canine, it's a bovine, <laughs> That's right. a cash cow. And there are groups that the, the wolf and the grizzly bear and any of these, these high-profile carnivores are money machines for them. And, and they're yeah. high profile. The, they keep them in the front of the argument. They mm-hmm. make them, they give them voice in the debate. Mm-hmm. But I, I get frustrated with it where you cannot manage landscapes through the lens of one single species. If you do yep. that, it's at the expense of all the other, whether it's game, non-game, birds, it doesn't, it just, that's yep. not how it operates. And you can't put one on a pedestal and then we're going we're gonna to promote that one at the expense of everything else. Right. So what's the status of where you guys are at in Arizona and New Mexico and your negotiations with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? And the, yep. Well, we're the, done. We've got a um, Mexican wolf recovery plan that was signed in November of 2017. So we now have our roadmap. We now have our plan of what constitutes recovery. And, and those recovery criteria yeah, for the Mexican wolf, and you think about in the Northern Rockies, we had wolves historically everywhere. And the Mexican wolf was really in the Sierra Madres. There was really just one big population in the Sierra Madre throughout the central highlands
islands of, of Mexico, and then they came up into southern Arizona and southern New Mexico. So we're not going to have three populations of something. We, we originally had one big oval. And so the recovery plan, since we've started recovering wolves in Arizona and New Mexico in the central part of those states, um, that's one of the recovery populations. We, the recovery plan identifies a second population in Mexico in the core of their historic range in the middle of the Sierra Madres. And so the, the numbers are 320 wolves in Arizona and New Mexico, the U.S. population, and 200 wolves in uh, Mexico. And then there's some other details. It has to be over those numbers for um, two wolf generations for eight years and, and some other details, but mm-hmm. basically that's the numbers, those two areas with those numbers. And so we were talking about before people learning from the Northern Rockies. And, and so people are suspicious all along saying it doesn't matter what recovery criteria you have, you're going to blow by those and you're going to have way more wolves than, than, uh, than those numbers by the time they're delisted. And that may be, and realistically that's the way we see other populations going, but we have no choice but to set in realistic scientifically, uh, supported recovery criteria and when we get there then we do those battles we battle those as we're approaching those numbers and we have those battles and and delist that's the only way to do it is just to work through that process but we have a recovery plan that has very reasonable numbers 320 wolves in arizona new mexico if you really look at at um how much area a wolf uh, pack takes up and you kind of space those out into wolf habitat mm-hmm. in the U.S. portion of the population, certainly in, in, in Mexico, old Mexico, a uh, lot of good habitat. We've, we did a whole habitat evaluation of, of air, the historic range of the Mexican wolf in Arizona, New Mexico, and Mexico, and there's tons of good high-quality habitat in Mexico for those. So they can play a, a, an important role in recovery in Mexico. It doesn't all have to be done in the, in the U.S. like some groups have said. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've got those recovery criteria. Where we're at now with, um, they just released last night, I believe it was last night or the night before I saw on Instagram, they released another group of seven wolves in Mexico, bringing, they said, um, the number of wolves in Mexico to 44 now in the wild. And in Mexico, they've got one pair of wolves that have have reproduce and had litters in the wild for four consecutive years. Some of those have grown up, dispersed, and joined other wolves from other packs and organically established new packs. So things are going Mm. pretty well in Mexico, even though they're in their infancy of of establishing wolves in that population. In the U.S., the end of the year in in 2017, we do an end-of-the-year survey, and that's our population estimate we use until the next year. And so at the end of 2017, we had 114 wolves in in Arizona and New Mexico, which was only one more than last year, but that's the all-time high number of wolves in the wild. Um, We had 88 adult wolves in that U.S. population, which is all-time high number of adult wolves, and that's important because that's the breeding core of the population. If you've got a good mass of adult wolves, the, the number of pups can fluctuate from year to year, but a record number of 88 adult wolves. We have 22 packs, which is a record number of, pa- of packs in the U.S., and uh, 28 or 29 potential breeding pairs going into the last breeding season, and that's a, uh, that's a record. So things are going very well in, in the Mexican wolf recovery and, and marching towards our recovery criteria, but when you see some of the press releases from some of the environmental groups, they, they say this is a big disaster. Mexican wolves are spiraling towards extinction, and by the way, click here to donate to help us save the Mexican wolf. (laughs) Um, So it's frustrating for those of us working on Mexican wolf recovery and working so hard for years to develop some reasonable recovery criteria. You can't believe some of the numbers that some people involved wanted for Mexican wolves before they would be delisted. They were numbers so high that they were impossible to reach. We would never get that many wolves and they would be permanently endangered and never taken off. Well, we worked really hard, the state agencies and, and Fish and Wildlife Service working together with some other scientists and experts to redo all of the population viability analyses, all the data that goes on behind some of the um, the coming up with those numbers, and and we've got and so we've got realistic numbers for those that recovery plan, and and not as many wolves as some of those groups want out there. Just the number of wolves that we needed so that they're no longer in danger of extinction. We can get them out of the emergency room, and and that's the plan that we have, and so we're working towards that. Cool. Well, the Sierra Madre in Mexico, what are wolves eating there? 
Yeah, some of the criticisms have been, well, there's no elk in the Sierra Madre, so, you know, wolves aren't going to do well without elk. Well, Mexican wolves evolve. The Mexican wolves are much smaller. They're a smaller southwestern wolf, um, really between the size of a coyote and, and one of the northern Rocky wolves. So there's a smaller version of the wolf, and they evolved in the Sierra Madre eating cow's whitetail, eating turkeys down there, eating jackrabbits, eating a lot of smaller prey. And when you, you look at... Um, you look at carnivores throughout North America, like there's there's studies that show coyotes in the northern latitudes, like up in the Rocky Mountains, they eat fewer numbers of species, less diverse diet, but they eat bigger things. And then as you go down into southern Mexico, they have a much more diverse diet, more rodents, more fruits, and a lot more species, but they're all smaller things and more diverse. And so that's what we had with wolves too. We had wolves in the north that ate beaver and moose, and we had Mexican wolves in the Sierra Madres that ate a whole bunch of rabbits and rodents and and um, and cows, white-tailed deer, and turkeys. And so it just doesn't make any sense to say cows, white-tailed deer can't survive on cow, or the Mexican wolves can't survive on cows, white-tailed deer only. They need elk because that's that's what a cow's white, that's what a, a Mexican wolf is, is a cow's white-tailed deer predator. And you see that with red wolves in the southeast. Red wolves are the ones that are in North Carolina. Right. And you do food habit studies and they're eating um, some like 40, 50% white-tail but they're eating raccoons and they're eating rodents, they're eating rabbits. Um, they're eating smaller smaller prey, and that's what the Mexican wolf does. And so there's definitely enough prey in Mexico to support the Mexican wolf down there. Huh. 320 between Arizona and New Mexico. Yeah, believe me, in all my years of, of wolf recovery, I was the person that was in charge of, of looking at the density of ungulates. And I have this huge spreadsheet where we looked at ungulate, just the amount of ungulate meat that's on the landscape and calculating whether that was enough for wolves. And I've done it a whole bunch of different ways with, with how much land each territory will take up, with how many pounds of meat each wolf will eat. Every calculation you do, 320 wolves doesn't concern me at all. You know, okay. 1,700 wolves concerns me. Right. And so, you know, we've got we've to have that battle and make sure that we stay true to the recovery criteria that, that all of the scientists have developed. And, and um, we'll get lawsuits. We'll get sued. We'll hit those numbers and people will sue us and say that they're still in danger. Um, we, just, we just have to deal with that. Yeah. There's no way around that. Yeah. Huh. You might be twenty six yeah. more years into your career before they get <laughs> before they get delisted. Yeah, it, yeah, it'd definitely be a while. I mean, they're, <laughs> they are forecasting that, but we've had over the last uh, uh, since two thousand nine that Mexican wolf population has been increasing uh, on the average fourteen percent per year, average annual wow. increase, and so that's a good healthy increase, which is why when when you know people say they're spiraling towards extinction, you know that there's something behind that, like like fundraising rather than yeah. science um, yeah. because it just doesn't make any sense. A lot of people trying really hard to make it look like Mexican wolf recovery so far is a big failure. And, and it's really not. We're on, we're on the road to recovery. If we can just keep the litigants um, at bay and, and recover the Mexican wolf. And, and we can do that in a way that we can manage them so that they're not impacting uh, native ungulate populations. Yeah. Well, I, I admire the, I guess... <laughs> you, you you have to stick to your guns. There's got to be so much pressure to be mm -hmm. over here, be over there, cave here, or step over there. But you guys, Arizona, uh, I've I've watched as you guys have been very assertive. And this is our state. This is our wildlife. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have a seat at this table, right? And, yeah, um, and we have. And and our our whole. Uh, our whole mantra from the start has been science is going to drive what we do. We're, we're, not going to, we're not going to put Mexican wolves in the Southern Rockies. We're not going to put Mexican wolves in the Grand Canyon just because people would like to see them there and they think that's cool. We're going to stick to the science. What was historical range? What makes sense? What is the, the legal obligation of the Endangered Species Act? There's, there's a law that says that Fish and Wildlife Service can't recover an endangered species outside of its historic range unless you can show the habitat within its historic range has been unsuitably altered or destroyed, like it's mm -hmm. just no longer usable, then it's reasonable that you're going to have to find some other place if you're going to recover the animal. Well, we do this habitat analysis, and there's all kinds of really good remote, um, highly suitable wolf habitat in the Sierra Madres, as anybody that's been down there knows. There's all kinds of um, ridge after ridge of well-watered pine oak woodlands for for wolves with cows, white-tailed deer, and these large areas, some of it controlled by drug cartels, and nobody's allowed in. Nobody can have a gun in. So there's these large 
areas that are not designated like national parks, but they're de facto protected areas in Mexico <laughs> because the cartels won't let anybody in there, especially not with a gun. And, and so, they, so that's the reality of conservation in Mexico is that you've got these refuges that are, that are being maintained by, by the drug trade. <laughs> How's that for complicated that conservation? That is weird. <laughs> Cocaine for conservation, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's support wolf recovery. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's not a campaign mm. I want to be involved in. Well, I, I'd be remiss, Jim, if I didn't give a little plug to your agency. Uh, you guys do remarkable work. I, I'm very impressed with Arizona Game and Fish. And the, and I appreciate how. that, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm really kind of biased because I've been there for 26 years, but I interface with biologists in other states, and I, I am, I'm, really, I'm really pleased with our agency. I'm, I'm really impressed yeah. with it. We do a good job, and we've got a lot of people on the national front leading a lot of cool things. Yeah, and the, you, somehow Arizona Game and Fish has found the secret sauce of opportunity wherever it can be provided, but yet somehow you guys are able to keep quality of the species as something that the non-residents anyhow cherish. Mm -hmm. I look at your elk, your elk are top end, your antelope are mm -hmm. top end, your mule deer are top end, your cow's deer are top end. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is amazing when you think about it because we do offer quite a bit of opportunity. We're not, we're not like a trophy hunting state. I think several years ago, one state had their commission just at a commission meeting, chop a statewide deer tags twenty five percent in every game management unit across the board just because they wanted to be more conservative. Right, and and the commission did that. Yeah, uh, across the board, and and you know we don't we don't do things like that. And we offer quite a bit of opportunity. And like you say, for all those species, jackrabbits, another mm -hmm. trophy animal that people cherish. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> hey, but if you, in our last podcast, if you get a chance to listen to it, folks, we talk about the jackrabbit camps that Jim and his, his groups put on down there in Arizona. But I, I am taking at least one, maybe two days, and I am hunting the uh, the antelope jackrabbits mm -hmm. when I'm down there in January, because when Hank Shaw got done with that thing, I oh. was ready to fight somebody for the last scrap. Yeah, yep. And duck breast, I've never seen anybody cook duck breast so delicious as yeah. he did there. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've known it was no surprise that jackrabbit's good, <laughs> good right. eating. I've had that. But you could spend a day hunting cow's whitetail, and you can spend a, hun a day hunting jackrabbit. You have way more meat at the end of your jackrabbit day. <laughs> <laughs> I found that out firsthand. I've, I've yet to release an arrow at one of those mm -hmm. whitetails. Mm -hmm. but, they are neat in that respect, boy. They are just, they're wired and on point. Yeah. And it just takes, takes everything. It takes yeah. pretty good skill. Yeah, well, this year I've I've told our crew I'm going for the Sonoran Dick Dick. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm right. going to find Anything. a little little two inch antlered uh, white tail. Yep, and there's no shame in a spike. No, I'm there's gonna no I'm just going to tell people this is a Sonoran Dick Dick. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to go to the Congo or Java yeah. or wherever else those little buggers live, and yeah. I just had to go to Southern Arizona. The other thing I like is that. It, you guys treat non-resident youth unbelievably well. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking at it today. Uh, I got an email that you guys have your, your I'll call them winter and spring hunt draw is open right now. Mm -hmm. And I download the regs for, this is what, javelina, spring bear, turkey. Uh, turkey. Mm -hmm. And a non-resident youth license it's five bucks. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. People, if you are <laughs> listening to this and you ever want to have your child have a whole gunny sack full of points in Arizona, go out and buy them the $5 youth license and start building points because now <laughs> you guys are on this 365-day license. So if yeah. they buy it now and apply them for javelina or whatever... That license, they can use it for elk yep. in February. Elk it and used to be that way, but yeah. you can. And then they can use it for the deer and uh, sheep drawing mm -hmm. in June. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you, if anyone listening to this podcast who has not bought their child 
a $5 non-resident youth license, every time you go to Starbucks and spend $8, you should feel guilty. <laughs> That's right. Yep. And so when the kid's 18 and they've got 18 bonus points. <laughs> yeah, or, or whatever. I mean, that's uh, so I was telling you my son has enough points for one mm-hmm. of these late mm-hmm. uh, Kaibab hunts. As quick as he passed Hunter Ed, he Did was, he, I took full advantage of that Arizona. Yep, right away. And, and people are like, well, he's already drawn elk in Arizona. Well, yeah. He started buying points when he was 10. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he's got a whole pack sack full of antelope points too. He's going to wow. draw that someday. And yep. he's 28. That's he, the way to do it. People need to know about that. He's almost got 20 non-resident sheep points in wow. Arizona. All because for $5 plus whatever your application fee mm-hmm. is when I could build points for him. Yep. yep. But, uh, oh well. You heard it there, folks. Yeah. If, if you don't do it, I'm done preaching it. Just go do it. Yeah, yeah. Or or don't complain to me that you can't take your kid hunting in Arizona. People that don't do it must just not know about it. And that's my job. I'm yeah, here preaching the right. gospel, Jim. Yep. But yep. Well, anything else you want to leave the audience with that we didn't cover? I mean, you're here in Bozeman, Montana. Yeah, yeah. I wish I was here longer. Yeah. I'm, I'm in and out. I'm, I'm uh, headed out to another meeting next week. Um, you're a traveling guy. Yeah, yeah. Actually, between, between your writing at three in the morning... And all your travel, uh, you get to see your family about as much as my wife sees me. Yeah, I, I know it. Pro- probably a little bit more, but I hear that. I hear that at home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ju- justified. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I I appreciate all the work you do. You you are one of those people who are so generous with your information and your knowledge, and you're such a huge advocate for science and wildlife. Mm-hmm. Yep. I've never heard you stray away from anything I've read, ever heard you say. You never stray away from the idea that science should drive this. Right. I mean, we have we, we all deal with a lot of controversial issues and the only way to solve that kind of controversy in some of these issues is you just stick with a, with a, a scientific foundation, you stick with a factual foundation and you argue up from there. Um, if, you, if you start anyplace else, uh, who knows where it's going to go. You're not on a very good foundation. But yeah. but if you can always come back and say, well, us, I'm sticking to the best information we have and the best data we have, I mean, it's hard for anybody to follow you. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this uh, migration initiative. I, I hope everybody will go out to that migrationinitiative.org mm-hmm. and, and, and start and find them on that. Just search for Wyoming uh, Migration Initiative on Instagram, Facebook, Facebook. wherever you are, and then there's really neat things that it, pop up. You'll enjoy going there every day just to see the imagery mm-hmm. and, and the the social media stuff that they must have some people helping them. They do. Yeah, they definitely okay. do. A lot of that comes right from, from Matt Kaufman, the leader, but yeah, they've got a lot of help because they're so active in that way. He, you know, he's got important science stuff to do too. He can't be sitting on Facebook all day. Yeah. I wonder how I'd get Matt on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. We need to do that. He's in Laramie. Yeah. Well, I'm not that far from Laramie next mm-hmm. week. I, I, I could be down there in short order, but mm-hmm. I, I don't know as much as I'd like. Matt's a really uh, special guest. Even that, I don't know that I'd shorten my pronghorn hunt. <laughs> yeah, even that. <laughs> Nothing yeah. against Matt. It but, is a pronghorn hunt anyway. Right. If it was yeah. an elk hunt, i uh, probably do it. <laughs> uh, well, Jim, thanks so much. Appreciate all you do. Thanks yeah, for taking no, the time. I appreciate you taking and, time. Uh, look forward to catching up again in January mm-hmm. when yep. we're down there chasing deer and merns and... Yeah. Duck season's going to be open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I'll stay down there a little longer this year. Yeah, well, we got the big camp running. You're, mm-hmm. you're welcome there. Mm-hmm. I, I actually called the owner of the house and said, hey, can I rent that again for 10 days this year? And she's like, you really want to? I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good deal. Well, that's a perfect little hacienda. I mean, it's, yeah. the location and how big it is. Yeah, we've got a lot of people coming this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't even so, know the full list. I know... Yeah. Hushin, Brian Call is going to be there again. Yeah, uh, Keith Balford from Boone and Crockett oh, you're is going to be there. Oh, no, yeah. Keith's a good friend. I've known oh, Keith he? a long time. Oh, yep. good. Because mm-hmm. he, uh, he, he, when I was telling him about it the last two years, he said, all right, Newberg, when, am I going to have to ask for an invite or am I going to get one? I said, well, <laughs> That's good. obviously you've done this before. He said, no. I said, really? Yeah. Of all the hunting you've done. So yeah. he's, he's good on a podcast too. I enjoy listening to him. Yeah. So he's yep. coming with me. I work with Keith quite a bit. We were just about two weeks ago, we were, I was reviewing things for them, helping them on a piece. Uh-huh. Well, 
he's he's going to be there. So we're going to have a good crew. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that'll be fun. I don't know who's going to do the cooking, but yeah. uh, I'm, I'll, I'll offer, but I usually only get one chance to do the cooking and yeah. people say, <laughs> people can we decline. find someone else? <laughs> yeah, <usually. laughs> uh, well, folks, if you get a chance, go to deernut.com. Buy the book, Deer of the Southwest, is that what it's yep, called? Deer of the Southwest. Uh, and anytime you see uh, an article or a piece with Jim Heffelfinger's name on it, uh, read it because I can assure you it's going to be worth your time. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks for listening, folks. Appreciate it. Happy hunting. <laughs>